some green start. This October 20, 2022 regular meeting of the Fairfax County School Board will now come to order. Please stand for the Pledge of Allegiance followed by a moment of silence and a performance of the National Anthem by the Longfellow Middle School Chamber Chorus under the direction of Kimberly Dawson. That was beautiful, thank you. Agenda item 2.02, .02, certification of closed meeting compliance. In order to comply with section 2.2-3712D of the Code of Virginia, it is necessary for the board to certify that since Fairfax County School Board convened a closed meeting on October 20th, 2022, to the best of each member's knowledge, only public business matters lawfully exempted from open meeting requirements and only such public business matters were, as were identified in the motion convening the closed meeting, were heard, discussed, or considered by the board in the closed meeting. Do I have a motion? Ms. Corbett Sanders, do I have a second? Ms. Omesh, all those in favor? That is Ms. Vakarski, Ms. Cohen, Dr. Anderson, Ms. McLaughlin, Ms. Darnat Koufax, Ms. Corbett Sanders, Ms. Tolan, Ms. Omesh, Ms. Uh, Marin, Ms. Keys Gamara, and myself. That motion passes. Agenda item 2.03, announcements. Mr. Frisch is absent this evening. If you would like to review a copy of the agenda and any agenda item that is being discussed tonight, that information may be found at the back of the auditorium or on the website at fcps.edu backslash school board backslash board docs. Tonight's meeting is being broadcast on channel 99 and live streamed on the website at fcps.edu backslash tv backslash channel 99. I call on Ms. Togby for an announcement. National Red Ribbon Week is celebrated each year from October 23rd to 31st. It was established in 1985 in memory of Enrique Camerna, a U.S. Drug Enforcement Administration agent who was killed in the line of duty while investigating a major drug cartel in Mexico. To honor his battle against illegal drugs, friends and neighbors began to wear red badges of satin and some parents began to form coalitions. National Red Ribbon Week grew from these grassroots efforts to form a national movement against the use of illegal drugs. Its annual campaign encourages students to take a visible stand against substance abuse and make a personal commitment to follow a drug-free lifestyle. The 2022 Red Ribbon theme is Celebrate Life, Live Drug-Free, is a reminder that every day Americans across the country make significant daily contributions to their communities by being the best they can be because they live drug-free. Thank you. 
Agenda item 2.04, Resolution Honoring International Augmentive and Alternative Communication Awareness Month. The board will invite each recognition recipient to the dais for a photo after reading of all the recognitions. I call on Ms. Cohen for a resolution. This year, Mrs. Cohen is going to try to make sure she says augmentative correctly every time. Um, resolution honoring International AAC Awareness Month. Whereas October 2022 is International AAC Awareness Month, and the theme is Show Your Voice. And whereas the United States Society for Augmentative and Alternative Communication, USSAAC, defines augmentative and alternative communication, AAC, as including all forms of communication other than oral speech that are used to express thoughts, needs, wants, and ideas. Whereas communication in all its forms is a basic human right and is specifically protected under the Americans with Disabilities Act. And whereas AAC includes but is not limited to gestures and facial expressions, writing, drawing, spelling words by pointing to letters, pointing to photos, pictures, or written words using an app or an iPad or tablet to communicate, or using a computer-based speech, genera speech generating device, and whereas AAC strategies, tools, and technologies enable more than two million children and adults in the United States to access their fundamental right to communication, and whereas research supports that there are no prerequisites required in order for individuals to benefit from AAC access that AAC users are presumed competent and given access to the tools and instruction they need to learn regardless of their speech impediment, diagnosis, or degree of difference. And whereas Fairfax County Public Schools is in the process of implementing a division-wide literacy plan that ensures comprehensive pre-K research-based reading instruction that is aligned with the science of reading to provide all students, including AAC users, the foundational skills upon which literacy is built. And whereas students, educators, and families will benefit from increased awareness about AAC users and technology and the combination of strengths and difficulties that AAC users can have. Now, there, therefore, be it resolved, the Fairfax County School Board recognizes October 2022 as AAC Awareness Month and encourages all residents and FCPS staff to learn more about augmentative and alternative communication, including identifying students that can benefit from AAC, understanding the core of presuming competence, knowing and making available supports for use by educators and families, and highlighting the success that AAC users can have in their careers and life. I so move. I will speak to the second. Ms. Cohen, would you like, I will second this resolution, excuse me. Ms. Cohen, would you like to speak to your resolution? I would, thank you. I'm so grateful to my constituents, the Campbells and the Lathams, for all they have done to educate me around AAC use and the amazing students and families who utilize augmentative and alternative communication. There are approximately 900 identified FCPS students that are AAC users. The highest number of AAC users are in grade 12 and preschool. Of those students, 14.5% use, 14.5% receive no speech services at all. 61.8% of AAC users re receive, receiving speech have only three hours or less of speech therapy a month. 41% of AAC users' primary service is autism, 19%'s primary service is ID, 18.5%'s primary service is IDS. Learning AAC is like learning a foreign language and requires explicit instruction and support in that language. So support services and fidelity of implementation are critical. Stephanie Coogan has written, given a child who uses nonverbal communication, an AAC system does not provide the child with a tool to form their own voice. But it is, sorry, let me start that over, does provide the child with a tool, a tool to form their own voice but it is an incomplete response to a complex situation. The child needs a way to learn the language system, use the tool, and exert their voice. We must give AAC language systems the recognition, designation, and respect they deserve. Think about the injustice. 
It's not a child's lack of ability that may prevent AAC learners from proficiency, but rather the lack of exposure, instruction, and opportunity. Thank you. Thank you, and I will now speak to the second. Um, everything Ms. Cohen said and more, but what I wanted to pick up on where she left off is what Ms. Cohen is talking about is a social model of disability. And the social model of disability says that while it is important to ensure that people with disabilities have the tools and supports they need to enhance their functionality, that people with disabilities are often more disabled by the society they live in than the actual impairments of their condition. And I'll repeat that. People with disabilities are often more impaired by the society they live in than the actual impairments of their disabilities. And that is what Ms. Cohen is talking about. Giving an AAC user a device without fully understanding how to teach them that it is a language for them to use and how to teach their society how to in use that language to interact with them does more to disable our students. It is really important that we recognize AAC communication as full communication. Um, I have a son with a disability and the one, I, I've learned many things from him. Most of the things in my life I think I've learned from him. But one of the most important things I've learned from him is how much we in our society equate communication with intelligence. And we do that in a variety of ways. And if we do not make sure that our AAC users are being able to be taught how to fully use, utilize their devices and their society around them understands how to communicate with their devices, we are not able to see the full intelligence of our AAC users and that is a loss to all of us. So I'm really honored to be able to second this. I'm grateful for Ms. Cohen for bringing this forward and um, I just wanna say the most important thing we can do to enhance our society is make space for everybody to show their ability and succeed. So with that, I will call, see if any other board members wish to speak. I see Ms. Tolan. I just wanted to uh, speak very quickly. I had the good fortune of meeting with all of my um, advisory committee members last weekend. And, um, and the very good fortune of having my previous ACSD or um, Advisory Committee for of Students with Disabilities um, member and a new person that will be representing Dreamsville on that committee. And they both spoke very hi highly about the need for uh, more awareness uh, for families, teachers, and um, school staff to learn more about these, um, about the AAC communication tools. And so I'm really looking forward to working with them um, on this topic. Thank you. Thank you, and seeing no other board members who wish to speak, I will call, oh, Ms. Amesh. Thank you, um, I'll, I'll be brief. I, I think I'd be remiss not to mention that October is also Disability History Month, uh, and that's something we haven't formally recognized, but certainly is related to um, these efforts, and hopefully we'll be able to recognize in the future. Uh, but I'll reiterate kind of a point that I mentioned before, uh, at first in welcoming folks who uh, have joined us uh, from this community, but to also say uh, that any shortcoming in our ability to absorb uh, and meet people where they're at as a system is, is on us. Uh, and it's not up to folks to try to figure out and navigate how, how to make their voice heard, but it's our role and our job to represent everybody. And, and um, that means finding the ways to make those connections and uh, remove blockers and, and put in place the accommodations to ensure that all voices are heard, literally and always figuratively, of course. Um, so I, I appreciate the patience and apologize on behalf of uh, our own system for the shortcomings we've had in doing that, but hopefully, as everything is, a uh, work in progress and, and continuous improvement to make sure that we're properly uh, including everybody. Thank you. I will now call for the vote. All those in favor, please raise your hands. That is Ms. Keith Gamara, Ms. Marin, Ms. Omesh, Ms. Tolan, Ms. Corbett Sanders, Ms. Janet Koufax, Ms. Um, McLaughlin, Ms. Dr. Anderson, Ms. Cohen, Ms. Pekarski, and myself. That is unanimous. Agenda item 2.05, National School Bus Safety Week recognition. I call on Ms. Omesh for the recognition. Thank you. The week of October 17th to the 21st has been designated as National School Bus Safety Week. And the theme this year is one bus plus one driver equals a big impact on education. 
Throughout the years, the school bus and driver remain a strong symbol for our education community, a profession that is, an important, that is as important to our education system as it is honorable. The week focuses on student safety when waiting for and boarding a school bus. School bus safety is an issue for all citizens of Fairfax County who need to be aware of laws requiring them to stop and wait behind a school bus when it is loading and unloading student riders. Motorists are encouraged to practice patience and drive gently around school buses in our neighborhoods and our school communities. The major responsibility for school bus safety in Fairfax County rests firmly in the hands of our school drivers and attendants who daily transport more than 129,800 students in 1,625 school buses on more than 6,500 separate routes, traveling over 18.3 million operational miles each year. Thank you to all the staff from the Department of Facilities and Transportation for their continued hard work to keep our children safe. Um, and we're really grateful that some of them were able to join us today. Thank you. Other board members um, will, wishing to speak will have two minutes to do so. Um, I'm sorry? That's the recognition, not me. Yeah. It is a recognition, but we've, it, okay. we've allowed board members to, to speak if they wish to for two minutes. Yeah, yeah. So would you like to speak, Ms. Yeah, Amish? Yeah. Yeah, yeah, please go ahead. Um, Thank you. Um, so I, I do want to, um, before getting a little bit somber, but, but I'd love to have anyone who's here, jo uh, who's joined us stand, um, and I'd love to express our appreciation even more broadly, really, whether they're here or not. Um, if we could just give them a round of applause for all that they've done to keep our kids safe. You know, the, the earliest reports of a school bus, in a little bit of a lighthearted note, uh, from the 1880s, they were called kid hacks. Uh, and that referred to hackney carriages, uh, where horses actually would push wagons. Um, there were specially built carriages to take kids to school. There were even uh, setups where benches were pulled by horses to take kids to school. Until, of course, the 1920s, when school buses were established uh, and became more popular. And that started with uh, a company that manufactured steel, steel uh, buses with windows, glass windows, um, th that moved us beyond makeshift kid hacks. Um, but, and, and all of that actually started with volunteers who were driving kids to school, driving kids to school. And sometimes that included students. So I, I think we've made uh, strides in, in safety uh, on our roads. Um, but uh, in a, in a more, um, on a more serious note, you know, the, the, res the recognition emphasized the importance of safety. And I do want to speak to that. You know, every year uh, we have hundreds of school bus accidents. Um, just last year we had uh, 430 in Fairfax County, and 237 of them were preventable crashes. Uh, and of course, we lose members of our community to accidents like this. Um, you know, one of our um, community members, uh, Ms. Helen Okobazgi, just uh, two days ago, uh, who was a bus attendant, and of course, uh, we're grateful um, for all, all members of, of our uh, transportation community, uh, passed away in an accident. In, a, in an accident it was not a bus accident, but she was just coming off of the bus. So I do want to just take a moment of silence uh, and you know offer a prayer, uh, remember her memory. But she was a valued member of our community, and I hope that we. In celebrating our bus drivers, remember the importance of safety on the road. Ms. Corbett Sanders. Yes, and thank you, Ms. Omesh. You uh, expressed exactly what I was going to start my remarks with because um, as sad as the situation was, even though it wasn't uh, with our buses per se, it impacted our bus drivers and our um, bus riders because this was a beloved person who um, touched the lives of many, many children every day. And so I appreciate your kind words there. I also want to um, thank all of our uh, all of our bus drivers and our bus attendants and even the uh, administrators at each of our schools as they help our children get on the bus every day because that's the beginning of a safe ride home. 
But what contributes to a safe ride home is what each and every one of us does when we are on the streets. And that is ensuring that we adhere by the uh, speed limits, go slow, stop when we see a bus stopped, and uh, just remember that the most precious element of our society, our children, are on those buses. And so please be safe and um, thank you so much for all that you do. And I look forward to having more bus cameras, long arm cameras so that we can uh, make sure people are all safe. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Tolan. Thank you. Um, my ride yesterday on the buses was very timely since it's uh, National uh, Transportation Safety Week. Um, I had the good fortune of getting up uh, quite, quite early and meeting. Uh, I learned lots of new vocabulary yesterday. I met a baker, um, which is a bus driver supervisor. I met her at 5.30 in the morning um, at Pimmet Hills. And I understand they're called bakers because they are the first people um, showing up at the shop um, to get everything going. So like, a, you know, somebody in a bakery. Um, so it was kind of funny to learn some of those terms. But um, I was able to do a, uh, we started out with Longfellow Middle School run, and then we did McLean High School, and then we did Spring Hill Elementary School, and then we did West Briar Elementary School, um, all between 5.30 and about uh, 9.30 in the morning. Um, I was exhausted at the end of it, and I didn't even drive. Um, but one of the things that was extremely striking to me was the incredible um, collaboration and thoughtfulness of all of our drivers um, as they work together to make sure that the transportation was happening as efficiently as possible. For example, um, some of our buses are overloaded and they are in fact this week counting. Um, the state requires us to do this and we're doing it with our transportation, counting every student getting on and off the bus so we have accurate counts of um, who's at every stop and we can adjust stops accordingly as we move forward. Um, so th they were counting all of the kids at the stops and, and there were some situations where there was some overloading so the bus drivers would communicate with each other. Um, I can't pick up all these kids at the stop. Can someone help me? And in the case, the bus driver I was with, we are very close to that stop. We swung by, picked up those kids and got them um, you know, to uh, McLean High School, no problem. But it takes collaboration, it takes thinking, it takes um, uh, lots and lots of work. And I can go on and on about my experience, but my two minutes are up, but just a huge, huge thank you to all of our transportation workers. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Tolan. Agenda item 2.06, Truthful Education and FCPS, Support for Educators and School-Based Administrators Resolution. I call on Dr. Anderson for the resolution. Thank you. Truthful Education and FCPS, Support for Educators and School-Based Administrators Resolution. Whereas Fairfax County Public Schools and the community it serves are committed to providing an academically rigorous education that promotes a responsive, caring and inclusive culture where all feel valued, supported, and hopeful. Whereas essential to that inclusive classroom culture is an education that is academically rigorous, positions students to be leaders of their own learning, reflects all voices, and respects the need and desire of our students to know the truth about historic and systemic injustice. Whereas FCPS educators, school-based administrators, and central office staff are developing curricular resources to meet our students' needs and the high expectations of our community around how historic truths, representative literature, critical thinking, and social justice. Whereas recent events have caused many FCPS educators and school-based administrators to fear that implementing those necessary curricular improvements could lead to personal or professional harm. And whereas in the teacher and administrator performance evaluation protocol, which is the Virginia Department of Education's VDOE, requires 
teachers and administrators to demonstrate a commitment to equity and provide instruction and classroom strategies that are culturally inclusive and foster responsive learning environments and high academic achievement for all students. Whereas it is the role of the school board and of the superintendent to support educators in carrying out the clear and important educational expectations of the VDOE and Fairfax County community that our students are critical thinkers and effective collaborators who acknowledge and understand diverse perspectives and cultures, essential goals of the FCPS portrait of a graduate. Now therefore, be it, be it resolved, the FCPS school board commits, um, commits to protect and support educators and school-based administrators in FCPS as they develop and implement anti-racist, equity, and justice-based classroom resources and pedagogy that meet the high aspirations of each and every one of our students and of the Fairfax County community. I so move. Is there a second? Second. Ms. Keys Gamara, Dr. Anderson, would you like to speak to your resolution? Yes, um, briefly. I think a lot has been said about this resolution, but there are some things that I do want to share. This resolution is in direct alignment with the work that is being done in Fairfax County. The work of the equity policy that was presented to the board on July 12th. At that point, Dr. King, who did that presentation, shared that the goal of that equity policy is to demonstrate FCPS's commitment to valuing the diversity of our community, creating welcoming and inclusive and culturally responsive school and work environments, and providing access and opportunity for all students to achieve and thrive. This resolution supports that work. This resolution also supports the work of the controversial issues policy, which is currently under revision by the board. This resolution is meant to be a signal to our teachers, administrators, and staff who are engaging in the work that we recognize their challenges and they have our support. Our teachers are facing some very difficult conversations in classrooms with their students. And they have shared with me, both teachers and administrators, that this would help them just to know that they have our public backing because these conversations are tough. And I don't wanna take anything away from our staff, Dr. Presidio and his team. They are working very hard to provide guidance to our teachers, but still they are asking for us to publicly share that we are here for them. And that is the ask of this resolution. Last week, well, last school board meeting, we read in the principal's recognition that educational leaders face many challenges in supporting and, ed and educating our students. This resolution helps to support them in knowing that we know and understand those challenges. The truthful education at FCPS speaks to the same support our principals and teachers are facing. What is it not? It is not carte blanche for our teachers to yell fire in a crowded theater. It is not an opportunity to be racist. What it is asking our teachers to do is to be anti-racist, to be equitable, and to be just. I believe that is what all of us want in our classrooms. And we should be able to share that and state that loudly and publicly and proudly. Thank you. Ms. Keys Gamara, would you like to speak to your second? Ms. Keys, yes, yes. I, I just didn't want to interrupt. Uh, thank you, Dr. Anderson. Um, I'm, I'm pleased to stand uh, to honor and to recognize, encourage, and support our staff members, our community, who have been a part of this discussion. As I thought about my comments today, I, I reflected on what we've been experiencing recently. And I realize that, or I believe, that many educators have found themselves in a quandary. 
um, board members have heard, I know I have personally heard from staff members, members of the community, parents and students, all of whom have expressed a clear commitment to addressing curriculum deficiencies that were not inclusive of all of our children by name and by need. That these people are dedicated, and I believe we should be dedicated, to courageous conversations regarding our history and the development of our nature, nation. This commitment has been challenged by our political atmosphere. There are those who have identified or suggested that divisive topics can be identified. But in the process of learning, what is more divisive? What is divisive? Can we really talk about how we came to be? Can we really talk about the history of Native Americans or what our fellow Jewish neighbors have experienced or our fellow, fellow Muslim neighbors have experienced or what refugees have experienced? Isn't that all a part of education? Today, I want to applaud and offer my support because this is a bridge not just from a promise, but to a reality, to a commitment of continuous improvement for every student every day. That is what we are about, and that is the environment that we are fighting for and standing for in the support of. One that provides a respectful, fair, equitable, and just environment for every student. This needs to happen and we shouldn't really quibble about how we say our support or how we say thank you. I noticed today that one of our people who helps to develop our curriculum is in the audience, Colleen Eddy. And to you, I have watched you work hard to dig deep, to make sure that we tell the whole story so that our students not only understand the good and the beautiful things about this nation, but the difficult things so that we can learn from the lessons of history. And so I want to take this moment to say not only that I support you and everyone on your staff and all of our teachers and our leadership members who are made, work, working with you for that purpose, but I want to say thank you for having the courage to do that. So today, I fully encourage this board to have less conversation and quibbling about how we say our support and to fully stand together and say thank you to every member that makes sure and goes out every day irrespective of the support they receive in the community. And they do it with courage, they do it with love, and they do it with dedication. And we support that and I say thank you. I call on I call on Ms. McLaughlin for an amendment. Excuse me, point of order. Thank you, Madam Chair. Point of order, please. We have to speak to the main others get to speak to the main motion. No, we um if there's an amendment, we speak to the amendment first and then we can vote on the amendment and then we can um after the amendment's voted on, then we can speak to um the motion, the main motion. I call on Ms. McLaughlin for an amendment. Thank you, Madam Chair. I move to amend the main motion by striking through the following language on the screen and inserting the following. Resolution of support for teachers and administrators regarding inclusive curriculum and instruction. Whereas Fairfax County Public Schools are committed to providing an academically rigorous education that promotes a responsive, caring, and inclusive culture where all feel valued, supported, and hopeful, Whereas essential to that inclusive classroom culture is an education that reflects all voices and respects the need for robust instruction regarding historic and systemic injustice. Whereas FCPS teachers, administrators, central office staff are developing curriculum and classroom resources along with incorporating more representative literature to strengthen student understanding of our complex national and global histories 
where it is the role of the school board and the superintendent to support educators in carrying out FCPS expectations that all students will become critical thinkers and effective collaborators who respect the diverse perspectives, cultures, religions, ethnicities, abilities, sexual orientation, and gender identity of our community. Whereas FCPS's controversial issues policy and regulation, P3280, R3280, provide essential guidance and support for teachers and administrators the, as they engage students in more inclusive curriculum related to racism, bias, intolerance, and injustice. Now, therefore, be it resolved that the Fairfax County School Board commits to protect and support teachers and administrators as they deliver FCPS-approved curriculum and classroom resources that are inclusive and meet the high aspirations of our students, families, and the Fairfax County community. I so move. Is there a second? Ms. Tolan. Ms. McLaughlin, would you like to speak to your amendment? Yes, thank you. I too wish to begin by conveying my deep appreciation to Dr. Anderson and to all of our community advocates who first brought this initial resolution and its request to our board. Without question, it is critically important that every single teacher in our school system feels supported and protected as they develop and deliver FCPS approved curriculum. As many in the audience have been watching uh, this from two weeks ago, our board uh, publicly discussed the initial draft resolution with a desire to achieve a strong collective support for this important message to our employees and to our community. After extensive board engagement to find common ground, I, along with Ms. Tolan, are now presenting this alternative language. It is our humble goal that regardless of the vote tonight, that our board, our employees, our families and our community understand how deeply committed we are to ensuring that Fairfax County demonstrates its commitment to inclusive classrooms and instruction. Without question, as someone who has a bachelor's in American history, I am painfully aware of my own public education and even my children's education. It has not been broad. It has not been diverse. It has not addressed historic and systemic injustice. It has not brought the diverse narratives and voices to the table. I know, as many of us who care passionately about this, that it is not a local issue. It's not even a state issue. At the national level, we are all trying to find a way that we can come together and demonstrate our shared commitment to being a better world. And so while I know that this has been unfortunately difficult as we tried to find common ground to come to language that we could all say with conviction that this is how we best communicate out to our, fam our families and our employees that we are unified in this commitment. I do hope that board members will join me in support as we do reassure each and every one of you the importance of this message again of support for our educators. Thank you. Thank you. Ms. Tolan, would you like to speak to your second? Yes, thank you. Um, I, of course, believe in the power of pub public education for all students and have dedicated years of my career to support students, teachers, and other staff to provide the best, most academically rich and challenging experience for any student no matter the difficulties they may be experiencing or their need for enrichment. Um, I believe my record and current actions out in my schools and in my community convey my support for educators. But I understand that our teachers and staff may want a clear statement that we support the work they are doing to implement FCPS approved curriculum and are happy to do that in a way that gets the message across but does not alienate any subset of our FCPS community. I also want to thank Dr. Anderson and the constituents she has worked with to bring this to our attention and to start our work on this. Um, prior to tonight, I've also had conversations with other community groups and have gotten many emails on this topic. I use this additional information to lend some ideas to this latest draft. 
The substitution that we're presenting is, I believe, more inclusive of our board member views and less divisive for our broad community. We tried to be sure that there were no misunderstandings regarding anti-Semitism or any other type of hatred. If the purpose of what we're doing tonight is to signal to our educators that the board supports the work that they are doing to implement FCPS approved curriculum, then let's do that. Let's do that in a clear, succinct way that supports all students and all educators. Personally, I think we should be doing that with a simple statement, but since this started as a resolution, we still have a resolution format. I believe the simpler version will send a message to our staff that we are behind the work that they are doing. Even the simpler, more straightforward title in this second draft sends this message. Thank you, Ms. Marin. The Truthful Education Resolution, as proposed, will be a statement against racism and bias for instruction and learning conditions in FCPS. The proposed resolution, as originally proposed, will show the school board's unwavering support of our educators, who have asked for this resolution to affirm their curriculum-based instruction of truthful and accurate history that often is complex and uncomfortable, and yet we cannot shy away from the responsibility of the school system to educate students for a world that is diverse in perspectives, religions, ethnicities, cultures, abilities, and identities. This resolution, as proposed, promotes the accurate and comprehensive teaching of historic and systemic injustices, including slavery, the Holocaust, and anti-Semitism, and other genocides, some of which our own current students and families have fled. This is not ancient history. Our children and people in our community are living through injustice right now, and this must be acknowledged and affirmed through a commitment to education. Finally, as an elected public servant, I believe that the ends do not justify the means. In other words, I believe that the way we do the work matters in equal weight with results of the work. And so I'll share that I've enjoyed working with the main resolution sponsor, Dr. Anderson, who has approached this work with collaboration, transparency, fairness, and principles. I've enjoyed hearing from constituents and staff that this resolution is a welcome statement in a politically harsh time where truth is questions and cancel culture dismisses people's humanity. I'm also glad to see this topic receiving attention in the community. It's an example of just how much this specific topic must be the focus of the resolution. When I consider how this amendment eradicates every word of work publicly published with advance notice, it is clear to me that the ends do not justify the means. I cannot in good conscience vote on this amendment given how this has been created and rammed through in less than two days notice. The language of this resolution is hollow. It does not reflect board collaboration and quite frankly represents a poor way to conduct public work. I will not be part of it. Dr. Anderson. Thank you. Since I did fail earlier to share um, a few things I'd like to do that now and then speak to this I do want to say thank you to the advocates who've been working on this and to all of the other groups who've been very supportive SEPTA FEA FCFT FCC PTA the NAACP Emmett MSAOC the pride liberation there's a very long list and I apologize for leaving anyone off um, clearly I will not be voting for this amended version for many of the same reasons that Ms. Marin just shared. I appreciate the efforts that Ms. Marin, um, that Ms. McLaughlin and Ms. Tolan have brought forth because they feel that this version that they have presented is less divisive. They feel that this version is more succinct and speaking to the support that our teachers need. I, I could not say that I disagree anymore. I, I disagree wholeheartedly. I think the reality of our staff and what they are facing, what we are asking them to do in the work of the controversial issues policy can be divisive. And we cannot shy away from that conversation. There are some essential components that are missing from the version being provided that I just cannot support not including in this kind of resolution. It's missing the terms truth, anti-racist, it's missing the terms equity and justice. And those terms show up in so much more of our work. We have sat here and we have been accused of so many horrible things. We have been told that we've been groomers, 
We have been told that we are encouraging pedophilia in our schools. We have been told that we also, um, that we have porn in our libraries. Yet we stand in the face of that adversity. We do not shy away from that conversation, and we should not. Yet, using terms like anti-racist, supporting our teachers who are concerned about what, how they will be received when they engage in these difficult work is divisive. It's difficult for me to understand that. And so I, I do struggle. I do struggle quite a bit from that because we are hearing from our teachers, this is what will be helpful to them and we are here to represent them. So in my perspective, I don't think this, res this version of the resolution does that. So I will not be able to support it. Ms. Corbett Sanders. Thank you, Madam Chair, and thank you to the makers of both this motion and the previous motion. All I can say is that this has been a, and continues to be a messy process that I have reflected on since the last board meeting. There are multiple areas of improvement which include the clarification of the process and the purposes of resolutions, recommendations, and statements by the board. As the governance chair, I am committed that we will address this in the course of our deliberations this year. There seems to be widespread confusion about the genesis of this resolution that was added to the agenda at the last meeting and whom is responsible for accepting and rejecting changes to reflect individual board member concerns. Additionally, there is confusion as to the purpose of this resolution. Is it a vehicle for signal signaling intentions for future policy work? or a statement of support for our teachers whom we are asking for, whom are asking for guidance and support. Both have been reported in the news. Dr. Anderson correctly stated in her joint interview with Ms. Marin on WUSA 9 that a resolution is an acknowledgement by the board of an honor or an achievement and is symbolic in nature per our governance manual. It is not considered a format usually used as a statement of support for our staff or students. Now, nor is it a mechanism for signaling our intention for forthcoming policymaking, as was reported. The three mechanisms for doing that, either through the introduction of a forum topic on an issue, which has been done on many of the points in this resolution, uh, is in I'm sorry. There are three mechanisms for doing that, either through the introduction of a forum topic on an issue which has been done on many of the points in this proposed resolution, or as a follow-on motion, or as an amendment to an action item that is brought to the board table for a vote, or in this year, especially as part of our strategic planning process. However, any intentions for forthcoming policymaking should be transparent and provide an opportunity for the community to be both notified and engaged. Let me be very clear that we have spent an inordinate amount of time on a resolution that does not and will not move the dial on what is the most important issues before this school system at this time. We need to be focused on ensuring that we are supportive of our teachers and administrators whom are engaged in an incredibly challenging work of meeting, meeting each of our students where they are, addressing the inherent delays in learning uh, caused by a global pandemic, addressing the shortcomings of the special Ms. education Ms. audit and ensuring that we have qualified teachers in each classroom, inspiring all of our students with a curriculum that allows Ms. them Ms. to see themselves in our literature. One Would you like moment. some more time? Yes, please. Understanding our history, including the good, the bad, and the Ms. ugly, Ms. and creating opportunities for life successes. Thank you. Ms. Keys Kamara. I'm sorry. I'm, I'm happy to go. So I guess I'm a little... Um, baffled at where we are. Mm -hmm. This is a resolution. So um, it seems more like 
this is being treated like it's more than, I've never seen a resolution um, receive an, an amendment. We usually talk about these things ahead of time. If it's not ready, then perhaps we need to have a discussion at uh, before another meeting, but I've never really seen an amendment at this table to a resolution. And so I think maybe we're putting a little more weight on this than is due the definition. So I went to Google because they know everything. The definition of resolution is a firm decision to do or not do something, the quality of being determined or resolute, the action of solving a problem. This is simply a statement of how we feel. And I understand that there are different ways that each of us think about this, and I respect that. And I think along the way that, you know, some people may have felt that their voices weren't heard. I know, I've felt it before. But I'd like to put this in perspective. It's a resolution. It's not a policy. We're simply saying, we support the people who are working to help our kids grow every day. I, I see you shaking your heads and I don't understand why. I'd love to have a conversation to try to understand because I, I really don't, okay? Because that's how I see it. I, 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 I believe some things have been read into this, in my opinion, that doesn't exist. I see your sign, it doesn't exist. Not in my heart not in the people that I've talked to. Nobody on this board is trying to demonize anybody in this community. So I, 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 I wanted to have Thank that you. perspective. Thank, Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Keys Kamara. Ms. Omesh. Thank you. So we find ourselves yet again in, in the same place of the, having the na national debates, really. Uh, at our dais and, and struggling through the same challenges and experiencing the same tensions that are happening all over the country. And that ultimately will determine the future of our country. Um, and you know, we're in a place where you vote one way, you're racist, and you vote another way, and you're an anti-Semite or anti-conservative. But neither of those are the truth. And so I look to our ultimate goal, our collective goal, caring about our kids, thinking about the future, and thinking about how we're supposed to heal all of this because otherwise we're leaving them with a, one, one heck of a mess. And the solution always is what? Education, something that we're all very familiar with. I want to identify a couple of things. You know, I, the, one of the main differences between the, the amendment and the resolution is using this term anti-racist. And so the question comes, where, do, where does that come from? What does it mean? What does it signify? The term anti-racist is really an offshoot of this bigger idea of anti-bias, right? That we want to create a place where everyone is included and valued without prejudice or discrimination. It's rooted in something bigger, an idea that we're trying to build a society that's supposed to be inclusive of everyone. And there are things we're going to disagree on, we've disagreed on till the beginning of time, and we'll continue to till the end, from a very deep philosophical level. And we have to accept that that's okay. But the reality is, to prepare our kids for the 21st century, we need to set up a system that's able to recognize its wrongs, but not only that, that's able to have conversations around all of these things which requires a teaching of the varied histories, which requires a, a, a presentation of the various narratives that we can't even agree on as a board. And I certainly ran out of time. I don't know if we're gonna have go-backs, but um, you know, I I'd like a go-back. Thank you, Ms. Amesh. Uh, just as a reminder, we're speaking to the amendment. At this point, we'll have a chance to speak to the motion, but right now we're speaking to the amendment. Ms. Cohen? Hard to follow all of that. Um, I just want to say I am beyond grateful to be able to publicly support our amazing teachers and administrators. Um, to be totally candid, like I, this amendment isn't perfect. The resolution wasn't perfect, um, but clearly neither are we. We're 12 very different people who come at this work with different backgrounds 
and different lived experiences, which doesn't ever make anything we do very easy. But we all do share one goal, to help our students be and feel successful as they navigate FCPS and the world around them. To feel seen, heard, and affirmed. So while this isn't perfect, I've always been taught not to lose the good for the perfect. It's the role of the board and the superintendent to empower our educators to carry out the clear educational expectations of our portrait of a graduate, that our students become critical thinkers and effective collaborators who acknowledge and understand diverse perspectives, religions, and cultures. Fundamental to that is an understanding of how we got here and how we move forward together as a country, as a community. Part of that is learning our shared history. True equity work is hard. If it was easy, we would not be doing it right. I trust our administrators to train our teachers to do this work well, and I trust our teachers to do this work in a way that supports all of our kids. Thank you. Thank you. Seeing no other speakers. Hold on a second. Do you have a question or do you have something to say? Oh, I apologize, Ms. Pekarski. Okay, thank you. Um, so as I've shared with my colleagues from the beginning of this conversation, I've had issue with the way in which this resolution came to us, the way in which the board worked. Um, I, I take process and transparency, I think they go hand in hand very seriously. Um, and any statements that have to do with the value or the policy work or what is happening in our school system, I really think need to be a collaboration among the 12 people on this board. So for that reason, um, and I believe this amendment was that. Over seven people weighed in. Um, not everybody agreed, not everybody had the same ideas, but it was a product of a collaborative process. Um, and, uh, you know, at the end of the day, whether or not we understand why the first resolution struck a chord or was hurtful to a swath of our community, um, you know, I think we need to dig deeper with that and learn and understand a little more. And people that I really keep in high regard and think a lot of um, tried to explain that to me. And for that, I, I need to respect that. And I will be supporting this. And I appreciate the passion of all the advocates. At the end of the day, I believe we agree on so much more than we actually disagree. And I wish we could find a way to come together which is what I think our community needs to do, instead of continue to find ways to divide ourselves. So thank you. Thank you. Um, Ms. Togby, did you have your light up to speak? Well, I'm gonna let everyone take their turn first before we go to go back. So everyone who hasn't spoken yet, I'm letting speak. Um, I wanna start off by saying students are seeing this. I am, <clears throat> I am witnessing this. I saw it last board meeting and I'm here again seeing it again. And honestly, I, I'm truly baffled by the back and forth nature of this. And this whole discussion, part of me feels like it's even taking a step backwards. Um, this statement or resolution is a step forward and it's supporting teachers and students. I am a student first. I will always stand by that. And as somebody who is still in the classroom, who's still experiencing moments where my education doesn't support me or where I don't feel seen in my education, I, I see this as a plus, as, as a success. And amending it to the, the weak and hollow statements and words where originally it was strong and clear, it doesn't make sense to me and I don't see the progress that can be made by going Burn. forward with it. I'm, I'm always hearing 
support students not only by, by name but by need and this is a need and I, I really am urging you guys to, to get this right. Ms. Jarenak Kofax. Thank you. I know how difficult this has been. Um, we've been part of this. We are trying, as Ms. Cohen said, to do the very best we can to respect all the needs of all of, of everyone in our community. But I believe that resolutions should unite and do less to divide. Um, I believe this amended resolution best captures but what we as a school system are committed to do, to ensure that our teachers, administrators, students, and family feel respected, supported, and safe, and that they will thrive. This board and previous boards have fought with tenacity and dedication to do this, to make this happen through policies, through regulation, through funding, and through compensation. As Dr. Reed has state, as states eloquently, we have seen you, we have heard you, we have affirmed you, and we will continue to do that. With our portrait of a graduate, we have vowed to empower students to become productive citizens of the global community. Some of the curriculum guidance included teaching by respecting divergent thinking to engage others in thoughtful discussion, to analyze and to, to be analyzing and constructing arguments and positions that ensure examination of a full range of viewpoints acknowledging and understanding diverse perspectives and cultures while considering local, national, and world issues, demonstrating empathy, compassion, and respect for others in all that we do. We know that our teachers are the heart of our system. Through various policies, regulations, and initiatives, we have acted to ensure that our FCPS teachers and administrators feel safe and professionally respected. This resolution supports the inclusive practices that are committed, that we are committed to. These practices should be discussed broadly as part of our culture of continuous improvement and best practices in work sessions with instructional leadership with teachers and administrators. And as we begin Mr. our Nicole strategic Fox. plan, I'm certain more ideas will come. I want to unite our community. I believe the resolution presented by Ms. McLaughlin and Ms. Tolenbess does this, Ms. and that's Jennifer. why I'm supporting it. Thank you. I just wanted to. Thank you. Ms. Omesh? Thank you. Uh, respectfully, I guess for the record, uh, I had asked for a very simple, not, not even consequential revision to this, and, and I was turned down. So I, I, I question the collaborative premise in fairness, though I know that was the intent. So I do, do want to acknowledge that. Um, but going back, I, I, I want to remind us, again, that this anti-bias movement came actually from educators. It was preschool teachers who recognized the importance of setting up a classroom by removing the blockers that have prevented kids from being able to achieve an education. Uh, what is it that let, led kids not to be as motivated and not able to access education in the same way as their peers? And we came to understand through, you know, Maslow's hierarchy of needs, through our understandings today, that there are many blockers to that learning. And so the anti-bias movement was born in the late 1900s. So that being that, the National Education Association across the country last year, hashtag teach truth, led a movement. Uh, and we know our educators uh, see this because they're the closest to our kids and understand their needs. And so it's an imperative on us to support anti-bias work and therefore anti-racist work as a part of our educational mission. And there's a place for everybody in that, even though I understand it's been signaled and misunderstood otherwise. And the final piece is, you know, I know it's not even a part of the current resolution, um, but liberatory was removed from this language. And that was a piece I felt very strongly to keep. Why? Because through education, we actually achieve our own liberation by understanding our narratives and our past and, and our worldviews and our understandings of others. We're able to appreciate how we relate to one another and therefore self-actualize and find our place fully and completely in every space that we uh, occupy, especially in a society that's this diverse and this pluralistic, where we, ha we have to do that to forge a path forward for each other. 
and, and, and that even originated from, from faith community, where Jewish liberation theology emerged post-Holocaust to find redemption and renewal, where Christian theology stood for the oppressed, Hindu and Buddhist ideology, Ms. Amesh, uh, liberation ideology, Ms. Amesh, your time is found up. a place for self-actualization. Ms. Amesh, your time is up. Thank you. Ms. Keys Gamara. So um, recently I was reminded of how sometimes being uh, an independent voice is one of the most important things you can do. And I realize we all have independent voices. But I feel I need to address this concept of this is a collaborative effort in this amendment. Because last week we had quite a bit of discussion about proper procedure. And that was the reason that we scheduled this a little bit later. And now we have an amendment that appeared this morning, at least that's when I saw it. And it's my understanding that some people on this board had an opportunity to discuss this, but I wasn't, wasn't included in that, and perhaps some others were not. I point this out because I'm hopeful that we can get better. I understand that people may not have felt comfortable with the way this came about and the way that this discussions happened. I wasn't necessarily a part of all of those discussions, but I acknowledge that feeling. But the answer, the cure to that is not to create another process that excludes people. And I know that that wasn't the intent, but this dropped this morning and we're voting on it today. And I understand that the reason it's here is because the makers of this motion know that you have the votes. So when we talk about collaboration and procedure, let it be the same across the board. And that's how we respect one another. I am not accusing anything of any one of anything, but I do encourage us to think about how we bring our, our thoughts forward and how respectful we are of one another. Thank you. Dr. Anderson. Yes, thank you. Um, briefly, I want to say also thank you to um, FAM. I cannot believe I failed to recognize you earlier. Um, and I do want to just kind of share a couple of things that I know have been raised as concerns. Um, the title was raised as a concern because the feedback was that it didn't appear as if we are, we're saying that we've never done this. Just like all the other resolutions that we have done um, at this dais, the title is just to affirm the work that is currently happening and to just to support future work. That was it. And I also heard some feedback about being this, not the version that I presented along with Ms. Keys Gamara was not as tightly coupled with the mission of the Fairfax County School Board and its critical work. I, I do wanna share publicly that I've had not one, but two conversations with the superintendent who this board elected to be the top teacher, top leader here. She found no issues with the language presented. And similarly to me, she thought it was a wonderful umbrella statement to support the work that is going on in this division, particularly the controversial issues policy, the equity work. It is an umbrella statement just to capture all of that difficult, hard work that we are asking our teachers to wrestle with. We cannot ask our teachers to wrestle with some of those concepts and we don't wrestle with them. Thank you, Dr. Anderson, Ms. McLaughlin. Thank you. Um, I really do appreciate board members speaking to this motion to amend the language. Um, because Ms. Marin raised the concern about transparency, it's really important that the public and our employees and our leadership team understand um, with, with accuracy what happened. So two weeks ago, um, Dr. Anderson did ask for uh, this language before, that was originally before us to be placed on new business. It was then understood that Dr. Anderson, like myself and like I believe all 12 of us, wanted to find the best way to get the strongest consensus of support. 
So board members waited. We heard from Dr. Anderson last week that she had some additional edits, trying to incorporate what she heard from board members, and a Google document was created, and we all started to give our feedback and input. That was a week ago Thursday that I sent what I thought was, if we can't get seven or more board members to support the original resolution that was brought to us by our advocates, then we want to make sure we have at least a resolution that will get board's support so that we can make sure we assure our employees and our families that we stand behind this work. So where did we go from there? That was last Thursday. I and other board members, we were reaching out to Dr. Anderson. We were trying to get a transparent resolution up for the public to see. And Dr. Anderson was working on this, but it never came back to us as a board. So yesterday, I spent all day reaching out to every board member I could think of who was still struggling with the original language to have an alternate in the event that when we finally got new language from Dr. Anderson, we wouldn't find ourselves with nothing tonight. Dr. Anderson gave us her language last night at around 10 p.m. So this notion that this amended language is not transparent is not true. We sent it as soon as we could. Ms. McLaughlin, thank you very much. Ms. Cohen? Ms. Corbett Sanders? I'd like to call the question. All right, Ms. McCarthy seconds. Would you like to speak to your motion? No, I, we don't. So, all right, we're going to take a vote to call the question. All those in favor of calling the question? That is Ms. Bukarski, Ms. Cohen, Ms. McLaughlin, Ms. Jarnot Kofax, Ms. Corbett Sanders, Ms. Tolan, Ms. Mara, and myself. All those opposed? Ms. Dr. Anderson, Ms. Mesh, all those abstaining? That motion passes. We are calling the question. So now we vote. I will call for the vote. The amendment before is on, is on the screen. All those in favor, please raise your hands. All those in favor, please raise your hands. That is Ms. Bukarski, Ms. Cohen, Ms. Uh, McLaughlin, Ms. Jarnat Koufax, Ms. Um, Corbett Sanders, Ms. Tolan, and myself. All those opposed? Ms. Keith Gamara, Ms. Marin, Ms. Omesh, and Dr. Anderson. That motion passes. Now, if board members may wish to speak to the substance of the motion as amended on the screen, please let me know. We had quite please. a bit of conversation about that, but before I give the board members a turn, because I did not speak to the amendment, I'm going to take my turn as chair. I want to make it clear the amendment belongs to the board. And when the amendment belongs to the board, it is wonderful to get feedback from staff, including our superintendent, but the amendment belongs to the board. And so it is important to have time for board collaboration. I also want to address the concern that um, we've never done amendments to resolutions. We've also never had a resolution put on new business. Once it gets put on new business, it becomes part of the business of the board. So that is one of the reasons why we can always amend resolutions, but it has not happened in the past. And what I want to say about this amendment is that for two months now, there has been great effort to have conversations uh, about... I I, have I did not take my turn as per Robert's rules. I'm taking my oh, turn I'm after sorry. the vote. I'm sorry. I'm, I just, I'm a little lost. I thought we just voted on the amendment. We did, but I did not take my turn. No, I'm, I did not take my turn to speak as chair. I am not taking my turn to speak as chair. That's. So it is really important when we speak that words matter and that we're clear with what we say and we're clear with what it means because transparency matters. And we talk, when we talk about something as important as curriculum and pedagogy, it is important that we're clear about it because then we do not leave a vacuum of lack of knowledge that often when we leave a vacuum, it's, in, it's filled with different interpretations that were not intended. So I appreciate this amendment because I believe it clarifies the interpretations. I have a point of order, please. 
now other board members who may wish to speak to the substance of the pending motion as amended may speak. So I will call on a board members who wish to speak to the, what is your point of order, Ms. Ms. My point of order is how could we speak to the main motion when the main motion has been completely it's erased? It's the main motion as amended. So the motion before us is the amended motion that Ms. McLaughlin and Ms. Tolan brought that just passed. So but isn't the amendment already essentially the motion? We, am we voted to amend the main motion. Now we may speak to the actual motion as amended. Okay, and another point of order, I appreciate the chair trying to stay separate from the discussion, but isn't it the process that the chair speaks last before the vote, or is it in fact that the chair speaks after the vote? My understanding from a parliamentarian is that the, when it's a contentious vote, the chair can speak after the vote. Is that correct? That's been my recommend. That's been my recommendation to this board that to preserve the impartiality of the chair. If the chair really needs to speak, it's best to wait until after the vote, just so that the, the chair is impartial while presiding. Great. Thank you for clarifying. My preference would be to speak before the vote. So now I will call on board members who wish to speak to the main motion as amended for Ms. McLaughlin and Ms. Tolan's motion. So. I will ask Ms. McLaughlin, as the maker of this motion, if you wish to speak first. All, all I can say is that for the public and for our employees, I want you all to know that this is reflective of the fact that at a local level, at a state level, and a national level, our nation is struggling to come together. And the entire goal of this resolution was how we as a board could come together. And there were many board members that were supportive of the original language that was brought forward by Dr. Anderson. But we weren't there to have a strong vo vo vote of support. And so this alternate language was simply that, to make sure that we didn't leave tonight with nothing. It, it, it breaks my heart that we are all sitting up here, leaving the impression for the community that we have trouble working together because actually that's not true. I spent hours talking with Dr. Anderson. We agreed to disagree on why she felt the original language or even some of the amended language should stay where it was. And so all I wanna do is hopefully model that when individual board members raise questions about our commitment to transparency to one another and transparency to the public, I'm just doing my best to make sure that the public understands the hard work we were doing behind the scenes, our goal to bring this to you as soon as we could, to have it publicly published as soon as we could, and the, the amended language that Dr. Anderson sent us last night I thought we were going to see that publicly this morning, published just like mine. And so all I can say is that um, in the end, I hope that we can, we can heal and move forward and do what we intend to do, which is help educate kids to the best we can. Ms. Tolan, would you like to speak to your motion? Your second? Yes. All I would like to say just take a deep breath. We are all here tonight hoping for a school where all of our students are welcome and all of our students feel safe and inspired and challenged academically and our educators feel safe and supported to teach the curriculum that those in our instructional services department work so hard on. That is why I supported the amendment in discussions over the last weeks to try to ensure that we can move this work forward and that we had as much buy-in as we possibly could have. Thank you. Ms. Keys Kamar, oh, she's not here. I guess her light was left on. Um, Ms. Marin? You know, one positive of this might be that we've been able to have a little bit of dialogue tonight, which is something that I, I've asked for, that our board be able to talk about the, um, the places that are difficult to talk about in doing this work that's very personal. But 
I also am just heartbroken that members of this board looked at our student rep in the eye and voted to ignore her, and I don't know where to end up with that. So we could talk all we want about collaboration and listening to students, but um, I, I just, I can't yet reconcile that. So I would like to help put us out of this difficulty and call the question. Is there a second? Ms. Tolan? So I will take the vote to call the question. All those in favor, raise your hand. That is Ms. Marin, Ms. Tolan, Ms. Corbett Sanders, Ms. Jarnett Koufax, Ms. McLaughlin, Ms. Bukarski, and myself. All those opposed? Dr. Anderson, Ms. Omesh. That motion passes. All right, the question is called. And Ms. Cohen. The call the question. Call the question. Okay. Back to the amended main motion. I will call for the vote. The motion before us is on the screen. All those in favor? Please raise your hand. That is Ms. Tolan, Ms. Corbett Sanders, Ms. Jarnett Koufax, Ms. McLaughlin, Ms. Cohen, Ms. Pekarski. All those opposed? Ms. Marin, Ms. Keith Gamara, Ms. Omesh, and Dr. Anderson. That motion passes. No, no. I, I'm sorry, Ms. Mitt. Point of order. Uh, first of all, not all of us got a turn to speak. I understand we, the that. The question whatever. was called. But the you misrecorded my vote. Things can well, be what's imperfect. What's your vote, Ms. Amesh? Ms. Amesh, what is your vote? We need a teach truth resolution. So I voted in favor of that because otherwise we have no resolution. Okay, so I will call. I rejected the amendment because we should have bolder language, but the alternative is to have nothing. So I'm voting for this. All right, so I will call for the vote again, Ms. Omesh. All those in favor, please raise your hand. Of the, of the main motion as amended, call the resolution of support for teachers and administrators regarding inclusive curriculum. Ms. Omesh, Ms. Tolan, Ms. Corbett Sanders, Ms. Jarnett Koufax, Ms. McLaughlin, Ms. Cohen, Ms. Pekarski, and myself. All those opposed? Ms. Keith Gamara, Ms. Marin, Ms. Dr. Anderson. That motion passes. I'm not sure anybody's here for this, but I would like to invite all those in support of this resolution to please join the board at the dais for a photo. If, without objection, I will ask my colleagues if we can skip this photo. Thank you. Hold on. I will like to invite all those in support of the National School Bus Safety Week I, I object, actually, to not taking a photo. And I would like to welcome everybody to come up because Th that is at least as a commitment to saying that we need to Ms. work Amesh, this out. Ms. Amesh, I agree. that I is fine. Oh, that is fine. We have Both objections. Sides. So I will I, call I all those in favor of this resolution to come up for a photo.
Thank you. I don't believe we have. Do we have anyone in the audience here in support of National School Bus Safety Week? Yeah. Okay. Um, so I would like to invite all those who are here in support of the AAC Awareness Month resolution to please join the, the board for a photo. Agenda item 3.01, community participation. The next order of business is community participation. Speakers must limit their remarks to no more than two minutes in length. At the conclusion of two minutes, the microphone or video will be turned off. School board members will be listening but not responding to individual speakers. The school board will not hear statements involving issues that have been scheduled for public hearings, such as statements involving um, such as the capital improvement program, budget, and boundaries. Comments targeting, criticizing, or attacking individual students are not permitted during public meetings. Complaints regarding school-based employees should be directed to the appropriate school principal or other school officials. Stu speakers should refrain from using personally, personally identifiable information in connection with an individual student or school-based employee. Additionally, speakers should be respectful and observe proper decorum in their statements, avoiding profanity, inappropriate gestures, shouting, and comments that run counter to the spirit and letter of the school division's non-discrimination policy. All statements should be directed to the school board, and speakers should remain at the podium until concluding their remarks. As a reminder, speaker substitutions are not permitted. A speaker may not yield their time to another individual before or during their remarks. Shouting and outbursts from the audience will not be tolerated. We are grateful for those who've come to speak to us today and thank you for your cooperation. Our first speaker is student number one. Our next speaker is student number two. Good evening, my name is Ollie. I'm here to ask you to address the issue regarding staff in FCPS schools and their accommodations for transgender students. Living as a transgender student in FCPS myself, I, have a lot, I realize I have a lot of privileges because of the work the board has done, but I and many others still face conflicts. I'd like to discuss the lack of knowledge some faculty members have displayed. Getting my name changed in the system was, stressful, was a stressful process and it shouldn't have been. Last year, I struggled to get my name changed in the system because a counselor had informed me that it wasn't possible to change my name in the school system without legal documentation. This forced me to find policy 2603, which states that I can change my name without submitting legal documents. I shouldn't have had to do this, and the counselor should have known that changing my name in the system was possible. While I don't blame the counselor for the lack of knowledge in the situation, these policies should be addressed more thoroughly in staff training sessions. That way they will know pol the policy if a trans student asks to change their name. I'd also like to address the issue of some staff members referring to their students by the incorrect pronouns and prohibiting trans students from accessing their gender desired restrooms and locker rooms. A friend of mine who is non-binary experienced gym teachers stopping them from accessing their designated private changing room because the teachers claimed that they were a girl and that they pr because of their gender presentation. These teachers proceeded to tell my friends that they had to go into the girls' locker room. Gender expression isn't the same as gender identity, and the way you express yourself doesn't have to align with the way society strictly views gender. That this fact should be highlighted in staff training as well to avoid similar situations. I've also had difficulty with a teacher in my middle school who would not stop calling me she, her, or ma'am, despite me informing this teacher I did not want to be addressed as a girl. She continued to recommend me books about the Bible and that are related to God. Oh God. Staff training should accentuate respect for students' identity despite the teacher's differing religious views. Thank you. Thank you. Our next speaker is student number three. Hello, I hope everyone is having a good evening. 
My name is Sarah Hoffman and I'm a senior at Lake Braddock Secondary School. I'm a part of the Jewish Community Relations Council Student to Student Program. I'm here today to share my experience with having the high holidays given off for school. I would like to thank the school board for granting these days off. In previous years, I've always had to miss school for Yom Kippur and Rosh Hashanah and almost always missed important schoolwork and even tests. Missing school so early in the year set me back and put lots of stress on me, especially as someone who does lots of extracurricular activities outside of school. I would have to miss sports practices and games and Girl Scout campouts that were scheduled on the high holidays on top of missing schoolwork. My brother once had a teacher ask him, why are you absent so much? It was only his second time being absent and it was for the most important day of the year for Jewish people, yet the teacher had no clue. I never got a perfect attendance award despite only ever missing school for the holidays. Last year when the high holidays were made a religious observance day, I still had tests and work given on those days. I had friends who couldn't risk missing school and had to go in despite it being the most religious days of the year for us. This year, by giving students off, you have decreased the pressure and stress on students throughout the country, the county. This year, I didn't have to worry about what I was missing out on or stress about having to make up work. I was able to spend my day in synagogue, observing my faith without any outside distractions. For the first time, I felt recognized by the county I've grown up in. By giving school off, awareness about the holidays was also able to be spread. People asked, why do we have Wednesday off? This opened up the chance for Jewish students to explain the holiday. Not having school on those days made other students realize just how important those days are to us. Again, thank you to the school board for giving Yom Kippur and Rosh Hashanah off, as well as Diwali and Eid. Thank you and have a good evening. Thank you. Our next speaker is Tyler Willis. Tyler Willis. Uh, I'm here to speak out against this school board. You've made it clear that your words and actions, with your words and actions, that your priority is not the education of our children. The Teach Truth CP, uh, FCPS campaign clearly demonstrates that this board has outsourced its responsibilities to an activist group. Free and anti-racist minds, which is where you got that language, uh, uh, their own website demands that FCPS curriculum be centered on social justice, include critical race theory and gender ideology, ignore state and national standardized assessments, and be independently examined for white supremacy. Zero mention of academic excellence. Zero mention of America's education falling behind the rest of the world. After years of gaslighting, parents have been proven right. The truth of the agenda behind this school board is not academics. You're using the education system to co-opt our children into your political activism. Further, in this resolution you claim, or should I say the activists claim for you, <laughs> to promote the high expectations of our community around our historic truths, representative literature, and critical thinking. Does this school board intend to include the works of authors like Dr. Thomas Sowell or Dr. Walter Williams in FCPS curriculum? These brilliant black Americans provide deep analysis and understanding of the causes of social issues for which you claim to care about. Unlike hucksters such as Ibram X. Kendi, who this school board saw fit to pay tens of thousands of taxpayer dollars. Dr. Soul and Dr. Williams' work stands in strong opposition with the educational curriculum and pedagogy you seek to promote. Does this scholarship count as representative? The, the tr truth, Teach Truth FCPS campaign states your true motivations, to align with far left political activists, to enlist our children in your political activism, and to do so over the rights and objections of Fairfax County parents. In summary, this is not education, this is activism, and I stand against it. Thank you. Our next speaker is Jeff Hoffman. Dr. Reed, it's good to see you. Thank you uh, for having conversation and listening to past issues and sharing ideas. For the rest of you, let me start my statement with a quote from the late Horace Mann, a pioneer for public schools in America. Education is our political safety. Public education is the cornerstone of our community and our democracy. I have one request tonight, and it's a voice of 100 parents across our great county. We want an open public forum to discuss the issues that concern us. Why is this so difficult to understand and organize? Many don't agree with you on topics like trans kids 
expansion and the lack of public comment on a resolution you just voted on tonight. Historic truths and representative literature, this is all anybody needs to understand our nation's history, the Constitution of the United States. You all need to reread the school board code of ethics. Once again, you didn't listen. And frankly, as elected officials, it's disrespectful to us as voters, parents, and taxpayers in Fairfax County. In my eyes, this is failed leadership. You have pushed political agendas ahead of student and school performance. Parent voices and rights, including mine, protected by Virginia Code and teacher views, are unheard, coerced, and held hostage. Education is better with choice. As an example, funds could be used for parent scholarships for private-led programs like Mathnasium. While you don't view it as a priority, true leaders believe in accountability and transparency. We've all had enough. To begin early preparations for November 23 as chair, we've established the Virginia Parents First Coalition, a movement to support conservative principal candidates to take your seats on a dais. Like Governor Yunkin, these new school board candidates believe that parents matter and want to renew and strengthen traditional safe and disciplined common sense classroom values in our schools. Thank you, Dr. Reed. Thank you. Our next speaker is Stacy Rose Harris. Good evening. I grew up in Fairfax County. I'm a product of the elementary schools, the Washington Irving Middle School and TJ. I moved back to the area after law school and I practice law in Northern Virginia and my children attend a Fairfax County elementary school. My family is Jewish and for all of the 12 years of my education in Fairfax County and my kids schooling until this past year, there has been school held on the Jewish holidays particularly during our High Holy Days, Rosh Hashanah and Yom Kippur, this has always been a hardship for us, having to choose between falling behind in school or our religious observance, as the student Sarah um, just discussed. Um, this past winter, the board voted to change that, and I'm here to thank you all. First, for the first time, I didn't have to email my, my children's teachers asking for them to send the work and what my kids missed. For the first time, I didn't have to remember to call them out of school. For the first time, I didn't have to explain why other kids were going to school and they weren't that day. For the first time, we didn't worry about missing something. And during these days, during these days over the last few weeks, I was acutely aware of this difference during the holidays and it made the day much more pleasurable and enjoyable for us as a family. Um, during this time, I also thought of all of you with gratitude for your vote to support the new calendar. Um, and not only, of course, gratitude for those who were in support of this change all along, but those who were undecided but kept an open mind and voted in favor of it at the end. I attended a town hall meeting shortly before the vote and was fortunate to be able to share my views with Ms. Keys Gamara, who ultimately voted in favor of the new calendar, and I appreciated her willingness to listen. Um, it should not be left unsaid also that the holidays and inclusion of Diwali and Orthodox and Rec Thank you. Our next speaker is Jenna White. Good evening. I'm wearing purple today because October is Domestic, Domestic Violence Awareness Month and today is Purple Out Fairfax. This topic is personal to me. I'm speaking on behalf of the officers of the Fairfax County Council PTA or FCC PTA. I'm also a parent of two Fairfax County Public School students. When I entered for a spot to speak tonight, I listed mental health as my topic. But we also wanted to speak to our support for Dr. Anderson's resolution, Truthful Education and SCPS. That left me with three topics in two minutes, domestic violence, mental health, and truth in teaching. They are actually inextricably connected. Earlier this month, myself and a team of advocates and staff met with Dr. Reed and FCPS senior leadership to discuss the statewide program, ACE Interface. This program is a community conversation around adverse childhood experiences and the 30 years of science and data that demonstrate how ACEs impact neuroscience, learning, and health and behavioral outcomes later in life. 
When a child is exposed to domestic violence in the home, that is an ACE. There are nine other original ACEs in the groundbreaking study that launched this work. Since then, the CDC has expanded on the original 10 ACEs to acknowledge experiences such as racism can be a source of stress so damaging to one's physiology and lifelong health that it is also known as toxic stress. We must be anti-racist and teach truth in history. Otherwise, we are adding to the load of toxic stress our students and educators of colors are exposed to. We stand for truth in teaching as outlined in Dr. Anderson's resolution. We urge you to learn more about ACEs. I have sent you information about an upcoming webinar we're hosting around ACE Interface, along with uh, Fairfax County community partners. The public is also welcome to attend and can learn more at fccpta.org under the event section. Thank you. Thank you. Our next speaker is Michael Ginsberg. Last month, the National Center for Education Statistics released its nation's report card showing the pandemic school closures wiped out two decades of reading and math test score progress. We also know that the school closures exacerbated education gaps among racial and socioeconomic groups. This is a generational catastrophe. So why are we spending our evening revising and revisiting the controversial issues policy rather than addressing this learning loss crisis? The policy already requires us to teach controversial issues impartially, objectively, and with sensitivity. It is perfectly fine. And why are we spending so much disproportionate time dealing with issues like gender dysphoria, which, with all due respect, affect a small number of the 180,000 students in the Fairfax County school system? We have a five-alarm educational fire, and this board is rearranging the furniture in the burning house. Every school board meeting should begin and end with the question, where do we stand in our efforts to help our children recover from pandemic learning loss? This should be the alpha and omega of everything this school board does until the crisis is over. So I implore you, instead of discussing faddish issues that might make us feel like civil rights champions, but instead ignores the biggest problem we face in education in this country today. Pandemic learning loss hit all students, but especially students of color, students, uh, 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 students of color, low-income students, minority students, and special needs students. So if you really want to look in the mirror and see a civil rights hero, Focus on that problem and solve it, please. Thank you. Our next speaker is Samuel Lewis. In the 1960s, DC Comics introduced Bizarro World, where everything was the opposite of Earth. So the planet was cube-shaped, good was bad, ugly was pretty, stupid was smart, wrong was right. This ain't no comic book, but if you want to understand the real meaning of this Teach Truth resolution, really an indoctrinate youth manifesto, you need to be influ fluent in the bizarro language of critical race theory. Fortunately, I'm bilingual. In CRT world, anti-racist means judging people by the color of their skin, not the content of their character. In fact, CRT anti-racism has as much to do with the real anti-racism as the People's Republic is Republican. In CRT, the cure for so-called systemic injustice is more injustice against the politically unfavored. What a wonderful ideal to teach our children. Your ancestor was oppressed, so to right that wrong, it's your turn to oppress someone. In CRT, historical truths are crafted with distort history to generate favored treatment for selected identity groups. When true justice, while true justice is colorblind, CRT social justice is always color aware. And equity, well, let's Let's use a real live example of bizarro equity. During the pandemic, the superintendent of schools for Evanston, Illinois, near Chicago, proposed that in-person learning would re be reserved for black and brown students and other marginalized groups. White children could only attend school remotely in the name of equity. When parents naturally complained, the school board responded with an open letter that announced 
quote, when you challenge policies and protocols established to ensure an equitable experience for black and brown students, you are part of a continuum of resistance to equity and desire to maintain white supremacy. In CRT world, equity is intentionally inequitable. And, savor the irony, if you oppose this racist resolution, CRT says you're a white supremacist, regardless of your race, religion, ethnicity, or heritage. CRT proponents should be ashamed of themselves. They're not teaching truth. They're brainwashing with leftist propaganda that fosters bigotry and hatred. Thank you. Our next speaker is Brooke Corbett. This chart was created by a mom who watched over 3,200 minutes or 53 hours of last year's school board meetings, then recorded how much time was spent discussing each topic. A digital copy was forwarded for each of you. The y-axis shows the major topics discussed in each meeting, and the x-axis shows how much time out of the 3,200 minutes in percent was spent per topic. On the bottom, at roughly 22%, the largest chunk of time spent was discussing resolutions and recognitions. Budget and COVID related discussions registered at nine and 7% respectively. Changes to SRNR, including use of cell phones and pronouns took almost 5%. The legislative package, including lobbying, the school year calendar and ESSER spending discussions all registered at 3% each. The school board discussed advanced academics, learning loss mitigation, special education, and academic curriculum changes zero to one percent of the time. In other words, all academic and learning related topics summed together comprise roughly one hour out of 53 total hours of discussion in last year's regular meetings. The mom also noted a conspicuous absence of discussion relating to teacher supports to assist with learning loss remediation. This data suggests that the school board has wasted significant chunks of time and frequently prioritized lucrative, powerful outside alliances and non-academic, sometimes politically divisive topics over planning and implementing solutions for academic achievement and recovery and over representing the opinions of all constituents and district staff. Fairfax County taxpayers should be reminded that these school board priorities are funded by a $3.4 billion budget. Thank you. Our next speaker is Aaron Lobato. Hello, and welcome to Virginia, Superintendent Reed. Board members, at every meeting, parents stand here and pour their hearts out. Do you really listen? Do you ever think, hmm, that's a good point? Do you ever follow up? For many of us, it feels as if you do not. It feels as if this board is focused on driving cultural change, progressive activism, and social justice, ignoring persistent increasing achievement gaps, and sidelining parents whenever it's more convenient. Our student reading and math scores are at concerningly low levels, and even more so for our most at-risk kids, yet this barely rates a mention from you all. You also seem unconcerned with, unconcerned with plummeting enrollment. Over the past five years, FCPS has lost almost 9,000 students, particularly in the younger grades. This is the equivalent of four entire high schools just gone. Do you know why they're leaving? Your preoccupation with a fight against a parental right to know what is going on with our own transgender child and a parent's right to opt their own child out of wearing a mask to school are clearly priorities. It is not clear reading, writing, science, and arithmetic are. And now your blatant disregard for our longstanding policy to ensure that any classroom discussion of controversial issues respects differing viewpoints is being sneakily sidestepped with the ironically named initiative proposed tonight. You all have one year left in your tenure. I beg you to use it to refocus on the academic needs of all children and let our schools be a haven for learning free from the social justice wars. I challenge you to spend less of your meetings handing out awards, accolades, and thanking one another and more time addressing real achievement gaps and respecting different viewpoints. Failure to do so will be a strong... Thank you. 
Thank you. Our next speaker is Marissa Solly. I came to tell you that my community, the Jewish community, is being targeted. In just the last few weeks, UC Berkeley Law School student organizations excluded Jewish students from their groups. GW students screamed Intifada revolu revolution outside the Jewish communal and religious building. Kanye West has been on, anti, on an anti-Semitic rant for days, and here in Fairfax County, swastikas and the statement, Jews will not replace us, was written on a high school wall. A Title VI complaint was filed against Fairfax County in January of 2022, detailing numerous incidents of anti-Semitic harassment of Jewish students. Worse, the complaint documents how Fairfax County administrators have essentially ignored these incidents. To this day, this school board and superintendent have not responded to the Title VI complaint. The truthful education resolution sought to indoctrinate students with the ideology of anti-racism, which divides society into two groups, oppressors and oppressed. Jews, due to their perceived success and general skin color, are seen as oppressors, even though, according to FBI data, Jews make up only 2% of the population, but are the targets of 60% of religiously motivated hate crimes. Critical race theory and so-called anti-racism are themselves racist ideologies that drive the virulent anti-Semitism we see overtaking college campuses and our own high schools. FCPS has regulations that require teachers to maintain impartiality and objectivity in teaching controversial issues to prevent indoctrinating students. Anti-racism, anti-racism. I'm racism, sorry, point of order. Could the speaker please say their, state their name? I am, Mar I'm speaking for Marissa. I have her power of attorney right here. Um, she had an emergency. Speaker substitutions are not allowed, ma'am. I have speaker a power of attorney speaker substitutions to speak are for not her. Speaker substitutions are allowed per our rules. She had speaker a family emergency and had to Speaker substitutions. Count. Are you really going to stop me? Because speaker you don't substitutions want point are not allowed Madam per Chair. our rules. Point of order. Point. I, I'd like to consult our parliamentarian, given that she's a, an attorney. I have a power uh, of attorney her. here. She had an emergency. Her father had surgery, and she asked me to speak no, for her. I'm no, it's up to the board whether to allow an exception to their rule. If they don't want to allow substitutions, then they do not have to. Our current governance manual does not allow speaker substitutions. Mad Madam Chair, may I ask, he said it's up to the board. I, I believe she's almost finished speaking. I hadn't finished. If the board would... I'm sorry. Would, you, can I mean, put it to, you can ask the board to vote on whether to allow her to continue speaking. But it, it would be the board's decision would be final on the matter. Okay. Would we like to take a vote? If are we voting to well, Mr. Parliament, are we voting to suspend the rules? Because right now that is our rule. Yeah, I would say that uh, it would be a suspension of the rules. A two-thirds vote would be required. No debate. So I will ask if we'd like to take a vote to suspend the rules. Hang on one second. To suspend the rules, to allow the speaker to finish speaking. However, we will be setting a precedent. Um, no, I'm gonna ask for the vote. I'm gonna ask for the vote, I'll ask for the vote. We would like to suspend the rules to allow the speaker to substitute to speak for the original speaker. All point those in of order, favor. Point of order, Madam Chair. Point of order, Madam Chair. I I'd like to just raise to our parliamentarian that this may, given this power of attorney question that we have not, in fact, specified, could this be subject to interpretation such that we don't set a precedent by making this decision tonight? Mr. Mace, Mr. Mace, that is not a point of order. That's a, that is a point of order is a process oh question. It, this is a process question. Is that a point of order? Is that an appropriate point of order, Mr. Parliamentarian? I mean, if somebody is the official, like designated representative of somebody. Hang on, Ms. Mesh, hang on. I'll ask, I'm gonna take a break. And we'll figure this out. Mr. Foster? We cannot be this retarded. Oh yeah. We will, we will take sorry, a- Sorry, what's the question? 
we were sidebar. If somebody arises having the power of attorney to represent somebody, right. would that be considered a speaker substitution, which is not allowed in our rules, right? Or would that be subject to interpretation? Well, no, it's a speaker substitution. Um, and I think that there's, there's, a, there's a motion, <coughs> excuse me, there's a motion that's pending before the board. It's a motion pending before the board with two-thirds vote to allow for speakers to suspend the rules to allow for speaker substitutions. All those in favor? That is Ms. Keys Kamara, Ms. Tolan, Ms. Corbett Sanders, and Ms. McLaughlin. All those opposed? Okay. That motion fails. Our next speaker is Amber Iglesias. Our next speaker is Tyrone Santos. Coeli Zuccheri. Peace, good evening. I'm Coeli Zuccheri, Dr. Coeli Zuccheri. Um, here representing FAM, Fair, or Free and Anti-Racist Minds. Um, thank you to those board members who have been, um, who have supported anti-racism or the work that we, we want to see done. I also want to mention I come here uh, in the footsteps of my ancestors. My grandfather was a pioneering black historian at a time when he was told in the 40s that black, there was no significant black history, that black history wasn't worth doing, and that a black man could not do uh, research on black history objectively. Experienced racism, right? I think what's happened here tonight, I'm very disappointed that this amendment was passed because I think it was a really underhanded, I suspect. It was a great way of not having to vote no, but also completely undermining the substance of the actual message, right? And I wanna talk about the word anti-racism specifically because it feels like people are very misinformed. If you're against anti-racism, you're either racist, you're misinformed about what anti-racism actually means, or, and or, you're privileged enough not to have experienced American racism. So it's not something that's on the, the, the forefront of your mind. Every time in this country that progress has been made, there's been pushback. But every time that progress has been made, people have continued to press on. And that's what I wanna see you do, right? People here have talked about being distracted by ideology and things of that nature that we should focus on academics. Well, guess what? I got my PhD in developmental psychology. What I studied was what happens to black and brown students, as the sister here has mentioned earlier, how they feel unheard in the classroom. Do you think that affects their academic achievement? It probably does, right? So if we don't recognize them through anti-racism and through truth, and I, I don't have time here to teach everyone all about all these things, but if we don't do this, we are taking a step backward, and Fairfax County is not setting a good precedent. You all are not moving with history right now. Thank you. Our next speaker is Kathleen Mallard. Hi, good evening, Dr. Reed, school board. Thank you so much. It's been an exciting evening <laughs> so far. Um, I, I agree with many of the speakers who have focused on the fact that we do need to rededicate ourselves to academics. I know there are so many issues which our students confront, and I'm totally empathetic. I've been to over 12. Before I graduated from high school, I attended over 10 schools, some of them in foreign countries because my father was a naval officer and we lived abroad. So I understand you know, the need for kids to feel accepted, um, to be understood. Anyway, one of the things though that I, I, I did want to talk to you about tonight is the resolution that you all passed in December the Human Trafficking Awareness Resolution. And in it you said that um, every high school in Fairfax County has experienced 
human trafficking issues. And we can put a slash there and say sex trafficking as well. So that is one resolution which I think is paramount. A student can't learn at all if they're being trafficked in some way. And also, I think you all are missing a lot of students. Not that they've dropped out or gone elsewhere, but they are missing. 900, 700 students are actually missing that have not been accounted for. And I think this is a major issue. I've talked to the uh, local uh, Board of Supervisor member and the local police. Anyway, also I wanted to talk quickly about the, uh, and I'll give you a copy of the, the sex survey. I think the sex survey is inappropriate for our kids. And I would uh, ask you to please stop asking them how many times they've had. Thank you. That was our final speaker. We also have two video testimonies this evening. The first one submitted by Jen Hands. Youngkin's model policies highlight the fundamental question as to what rights parents have to their own children. The Fairfax County School Board would vote to say parents do not have rights, that the schools are solely positioned to influence, guide, teach, and control the children enrolled in the schools. The Fairfax County School Board would say that parents would unjustly influence their children and that they are too cruel, for example, to deal with their own child. So the schools must keep important information concerning their children secret from the parents. In Superintendent Michelle Reed's seven paragraph email to the community concerning the policies, there was not one mention of parents. Because in her view, parents have no place in being informed of major issues in their child's life. The parents rightfully believe that it's their job to raise, nurture, guide, and shape the values, morals, and values of their own children. Parents love their kids. We hug them when they've had a bad day. We encourage them when they're down. We listen to them when they're confused and guide them regarding choices that will affect the rest of their lives. These are our children. They are not the wards of the state and they belong to the parents and the parents alone. So to get back to the original question, does the school board have the right to displace parents in the primary giver role? Absolutely not. No way, no way, no way we will allow that to happen in Fairfax County. This is the line that all parents and voters must stand up for. Hold the line. Our next video was submitted by Kara Danner. My name is Kara Danner and I'm a member of the executive board of the Fairfax County Council PTA. This year, several FCC PTA speakers have emphasized the overwhelming need to address the mental health needs of our students. This is why our PTA Council has endorsed the Truth in Education or Teaching Truth resolution that was proposed by Dr. Anderson in September. The resolution encourages and protects administrators and teachers as they work to make our schools inclusive by acknowledging that the FCPS curriculum is and must continue to be a liberatory curriculum at all levels. We strive to make our schools places where all children belong. Anti-racism and anti-exclusion in our schools and classrooms improve the mental health of black and brown students, immigrants, students with disabilities, religious minorities, and LGBTQ plus students. Transgender students are particularly vulnerable right now. The mental health of our students is at stake. Their very lives are at stake. The school board cannot fail to act and it must not weaken this resolution by removing words such as liberatory and anti-racist. Teachers and administrators need to know that they are safe when they include and support all students. The FCC PTA has already issued a statement in support of the resolution as presented in September. We stand by that. Agenda item 3.02, strategic plan update. I call on Dr. Reed for an update on the strategic plan. Madam, Madam Chair, may we take a brief recess please? All right, doctor, we will take a five minute recess before we have the presentation.
Board members, if you could please take your seats. We're going to get started. Board members, if you could please take your seats. We're going to get started. All right, we will come back after our break. So agenda item 3.02, strategic plan update. I call on Dr. Reed for an update on the strategic plan. Good evening, uh, Madam Chair and Board. So what I'm going to share this evening is an abbreviated uh, set of slides uh, from those which we um, shared at our work session. But I want to make sure um, that our community understands the process we're embarking on and the possibilities inherent in this work as we begin to um, establish our North Star that will uh, connect us this year and beyond. I ideally, we're looking at um, two questions, really, when we sum things up. And the two questions Mutu Fabai has been talking with us a great deal about kind of boil down to how are the children and how is your household? And as we progress through the next few months, we're going to talk a lot about um, how we are and how we're able to achieve great outcomes for our students um, in the coming months. So let's go ahead and move to the next slide. Thank you. One of the things that's really important, and we had a chance, our leadership team uh, and I had a chance to meet with our high school principals and our elementary principals today. And there was a lot of discussion around workload issues right now and the challenges of the work returning from the pandemic. And one of the things that I believe a strategic plan is going to do is not add work, but rather align the work that we're currently doing. When our work's aligned, we're able to be more efficient and I think feel less overwhelmed at times while getting stronger results for our students. So we're really excited about this power of alignment um, because we know that our initiatives, while um, well-intentioned and great, you know, impassioned work. Um, at times, if they're not aligned, they're not going to lead us where we need to be for each and every student. So go ahead for the next one, please. These are the phases of our planning process. Just want to remind our community that right now we're mobilizing and asking for participate our participation and putting together our different groups, which I'll describe here in a moment. So that's our work for October, November. And we plan to have formal board approval by May 23rd of our strategic plan so that we're able to um, launch this over the summer and be ready to roll in the fall of 2023. This is work that um, our intent is to seek all voices in the community as we proceed over the next several months to define the direction uh, for our, the future of our division. Next slide, please. The process, if we want to just simplify it this evening, is really a three-step process. We're going to look at what data we currently have, and that's student data from a variety of sources. Then we're going to analyze in a discovery stage, which really answers two questions. What does the data say? And why does it look the way it looks? And then finally, the third piece is what are we going to do about it? And when we put those three pieces together, it's our intent as we work with our students, our staff, our parents, our families, our community members, our business community, elected leaders, and community stakeholders that we're going to be able to define a solution that we can all uh, put energy behind. Next slide, please. Essentially. We want to remind our community that we have to keep our ends and means in the proper order as we center equity in our strategic planning. In the first circle is really around student learning. The second circle, which surrounds and supports our student learning, is our instructional uh, 
effectiveness, which sits within the context of an empowering infrastructure. Next slide, please. Uh, one of the things that's really key is that we're talking about a wide net, in other words, a net that envelops, if you will, our entire community across the county, while the process for gathering input, feedback, and our ultimate direction is going to be a very tight and transparent process. Next slide, please. These are the different groups of diverse voices, again, with the expectation of being able to align in a unified direction. We're talking about authentic and meaningful engagement over the course of the next few months with regular reports to the board, as well as regular reports to staff, students, and our community writ large. I am really excited to begin this process. As we think about the different teams and the uh, purposes of each team, the core planning team, which is the CPT in the middle of this diagram, will be a very um, diverse team of likely 100 to 150 members, including students, staff, families, community members, uh, board members. Um, and this group will be, uh, if you will, an iterative group uh, receiving reports and information from all of the other groups in a synergistic fashion. In other words, work will come back and go out and come back and go out as we begin the analysis of all the data we collect and the synthesis of those results to craft a plan that will guide the entire division. Next slide, please. Thank you. Again, this is a slide in terms of discussion of the levels of the stakeholder engagement, which really um, outlines the relative uh, engagement commitment folks will make for each committee or each forum. And again, there is a space for every community member, every student, family member, elected business leader, or stakeholder in the community to involve themselves in some way in the strategic plan. There's a spot for every voice in this work. At this point, that is my update this evening, and I'm happy to take any questions. If, um, so I have Ms. Corbett Sanders. Yes, I wanted to just thank you, Dr. Reed, uh, for the synopsis. I think it's important to share with the community what our plans are. I know that you and your team have sent out communications and that you also, that this work is going to be building on the community conversations you've already embarked on. But I think what's so critical here is that chart which talks about that student-focused, uh, data-centric approach, and then reimagining what our school system should be to meet the unique needs of each and every child to be able to be successful, not, even, not only while they're in our K through 12 system, but beyond. And so I appreciate you presenting this in this way, and I know that we're all committed to working with you to ensure that our that we are all in alignment and that the resources are in alignment as well thank you thank you any other board members wish to speak Ms. keith tomorrow thank you thank you um i appreciate uh having the opportunity to discuss this uh mm -hmm. in in this board meeting right. um and i hope we get a opportunity to do more of this yeah. um in light of some of the comments that we heard tonight, um, I'm going to I'm going to put a ball on a tee ball on the tee stand and just let you hit it. I know the answers, but I think the community um, does, the community needs to hear how this process is focused on academics and student success. Thank you, Ms. Keys Gamara. I think to your point, this plan is this plan is about forming number one, 
this strategic plan is intended to have its goals be in student outcomes. Mm -hmm. We exist as a division to educate students, each and every one of our students, because we know the power of that education is about the trajectory of the rest of each and every one of our students' lives. It is not just about the time they spend with us. What this plan and process will enable us to do as a community is to identify those outcomes we believe as a community and a division are most important for each and every one of our students. What is the course progression path that we believe in Fairfax County will set us apart as a world-class division in this country and create that um, synergy that all other divisions will look to us for. So my expectation is that that deep and rich educational experience that's gonna prepare our kids, our students, and our young people for that world yet to be imagined is what this process is gonna yield. When we align our purpose and our work, there isn't anything we can't accomplish to achieve those high academic achieve, you know, ideals for each and every ch uh, child. Thank you. Um, I, I realize that was a pretty basic question, but I, I felt it was necessary uh, just to really state that these kinds of conversations, budget conversations, are all about student success and, and um, improving student achievement. Um, I will ask the question, I know you've had uh, several town halls um, in the community. Now we're going in this to the, this period of outreach. Um, I, you know, I look forward to, and you may not have an answer to it, but I do have some concerns about how many times people are going to be willing to come out, how we may need to um, adjust how we reach out to people or how we find ourselves in their worlds to be able to have effective communication. So I'm a little worried about, um, you know, outreach burnout, right, uh, and people's willingness to respond, oh, is that them, delete email. Um, so I know we'll be having ongoing conversations, but I, I just want the community to know that outreach is, is critical to this process, and um, that includes, I believe you added, a, a, I didn't see it up there, but you added a category uh, specifically for parents um, yes. to make sure that we are hearing from them. Um, and I think those were my comments. I just really wanted to make sure, um, in light of all the noise that we kind of heard tonight, that we get back to this is what we're about. We never lost focus. I don't believe we have. Um, but even this report tonight is um, an example right. of, of that um, commitment. So thank you. Thank you, Ms. Keys Gamara. And I, I appreciate you addressing the issue of how often will people come out? And I want to um, remind us that one of the, um, that there will be a variety of ways to provide input. Um, indeed, we're looking at all students, grades three through 12, having an opportunity within school to uh, provide their feedback as well as all staff. Um, and there haven't, um, and as well as all parents and families, right? So, and we'll be sharing more ways to participate. But I think that's really, well said, if ever there's a time to lean in and you know add a voice to this work, it's now. So thank you for raising that. Thank you, Ms. Amesh. Thank you. Um, I'm trying to shake off a little bit of <clears throat> the mood from before. I do want to celebrate this moment. I think that you know I felt strongly, and my colleagues as well, I know, that we should uh, really n uh, kick this off and in, in, in uh, sharing with our community that we're beginning this process, um, you know, this is a process that is setting the new vision, the new plan for our entire division. And I want the community to make sure they're, they're paying attention and that they're part of this process. You know, Dr. Reed, I've really appreciated uh, your efforts to make sure that you're doing robust public engagement. Those have been conversations that are ongoing still, but uh, that have certainly been robust uh, for us as a team. I'm trying to really figure out how do we reach those people we don't even realize we're not reaching mm -hmm. um, and make sure that everyone's voice is a part of this process so that we can build a vision together that doesn't have holes that that makes everyone feel they're a part of it and that doesn't end up right with the divisions we're constantly trying to to avoid and then uh, we're forced to heal once you know when we make those mistakes so really I just wanted to 
make sure this moment didn't pass without recognizing that this is a huge opportunity for us. Uh, and I'm hopeful that as you all begin posting the schedules of, of when you'll be where, uh, that the community pays close attention and participates in that process uh, to make sure it's, it's one that's inclusive of everyone. So thank you, Dr. Reed. Thank you, Ms. Omish. Thank you, Dr. Anderson. Your, your light was on, I wasn't sure. All right, seeing no other speakers, I'd just like to say one quick thing on this. I apologize, Dr. Reed. Like, I almost made it out of here. <laughs> um, I just wanted to say, I, you know, I'm really appreciative of you, uh, it's your last minute coming here to share this. Um, and just to remind people who are watching out there that we do do the bulk of our work where we talk about many of these issues in our work sessions as opposed right. to our regular meetings. By the time we come here, we're really here to vote on action items that we've discussed. And so we did have a pretty robust work session on this just on Tuesday right. where we had um, many presentations and chance for board comment about our strategic plan and that is one of our ongoing um, work sessions on our strategic plan so i just wanted to so remind folks that if they're looking for where we're digging into issues go watch the youtube videos of our work sessions it's a great way to enjoy your evening so having said that thank you so much dr reed for the presentation right. thanks madam chair agenda item 3.03 .03, student representative matters I call on Ms. Togby. Thank you, Madam Chair. Good evening, everyone, and happy Thursday. Thank you to the students who came to speak tonight, Ali and Sarah, you guys were truly the highlights of the meeting. Um, we have made it to week nine, and we are close to the end of the first quarter. I know I'm secretly celebrating, um, and honestly, I can't believe how quickly time has passed. It's been amazing seeing the accomplishments that have been made at every school and all in all just witnessing a pretty great school year. I got the chance to participate in the strategic planning portion of the meeting on Tuesday and I can't wait to see the final product once information with beneficial feedback is gathered. Tomorrow I know that I'm going to take part in filming a video to promote awar awareness as to what strategic planning is and the importance of the involvement of students and the feedback that they will equip us with. Um, Originally, I was going to go in a completely di different direction with my remarks, but um, after the last few hours, I believe I, I have a few more important things to say. Um, earlier in the strategic planning updates, a slide that stood out to me included the words student learning and instructional effectiveness, and I understand the commitment that we are trying to make, but at this point in time, I can say that we are running in circles. I can see that. I'm sure you all can recognize that within yourselves and my peers can 100% see that themselves. I've said it before and I will say it again until everyone here truly understands what it means. Equity leadership is everyone's work and what students see informs how we engage and how we engage informs how we act. Think about that and recognize the needs of students that are not being met. On the FCPS website, it says, our mission is to inspire and empower students. Today, we had the perfect opportunity to do just that and look at what happened. I don't really have much left to say, but I, I really do have high hopes and I think that once everyone collaborates together, once transparency is 100% effective, I think done will truly be amazing, but I think right now this is a moment to reflect and see what could be done better, and that is all I have to say. Thank you. Agenda item 3.04, Superintendent Matters. I call on Dr. Reed. Thank you, Madam Chair, um, and thank you, Ms. Togby. I, uh, this evening, I just want to um, indicate that I've... Um, attended a number of events and visited a number of schools since last we met and really feel like there are just amazing things going on around the division right now. So for all um, the um, sort of work and efforts of our educators and our support staff in all roles, there's some amazing opportunities and amazing achievements going on really each and every day in small ways and large all across this division. And I want to mention that one of the highlights of uh, the experience that I shared with several of the board colleagues was the Fairfax County Public School Excellence Awards recognition evening. 
And that was such a nice event and such an incredible evening to recognize so many inspiring staff members across our division and just their excitement and enthusiasm to be recognized for so many different um, gifts and contributions. It really was an inspiring evening and I thank our um, instructional services and professional development and human resources departments uh, who really hosted that um, under the leadership of Dr. Wilson and Marty Smith. It was just a tremendous evening and I, I don't know, I kind of was beaming about it for days, so I think it's something to really be proud of. I have concluded, I think, 23 pyramid conversations so far. Uh, most recently, I've been to Oakton, Fairfax, and Centerville. Um, and if you haven't had an opportunity to attend one of those and you're listening, I would encourage you to. We're getting close to the end of our community conversations. It's hard to believe I don't know what I'll do with my evenings. Um, but also want to mention that uh, in terms of academics, and I know that um, our achievement is obviously very important, I want to report that our Fairfax County Public School seniors in the class of 2022 last year uh, performed well above state and global averages on the SAT. And I think that's something to be said given the conditions obviously that many students had throughout this pandemic, but to be above both um, our state, national, and global averages is pretty impressive. Our mean score of 1185 um, per surpassed the state average by a significant and the global average of 1050. Um, likewise, our uh, evidence-based reading and writing and mathematics subtest scores posted above the state and global averages for students overall in an every reporting group, um, which I think is pretty impressive for us. I want to remind our military connected families that beginning October 18th, we are going to be asking uh, to have our impact aid forms filled out. And I know that um, Colonel Messina at Fort Belvoir and I put together a short video um, to talk about the importance in a collaborative way of the impact aid funds and what they support. And also want to thank our um, military connected families for joining us uh, last week and share their experience and um, the opportunities we have to continue to serve and support our military connected students and families. I want to, um, to uh, the com, you know, to the concerns around um, innovation. I want to share that we do have an opportunity to partner with Nova and George Mason University on a lab school proposal, and we're very excited about that opportunity, which will provide 200,000 in planning dollars to look at an innovative lab school um, and pathways for credit for our students. And lastly, a reminder for our parent community that November is National Parent Engagement Month and to really uh, consider joining local PTAs and PTSAs or PTOs um, as we support our um, schools uh, with parent engagement in November. So that is my report. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Reed. Agenda item four, action items. Agenda item 4.01. Confirmation of action taken and closed. This is the portion of the meeting where, board, where the board will confirm any action regarding issues that were discussed in the closed meeting. These issues may include action taken regarding student disciplinary matters. Board members have discussed each individual case and at this time will make several motions to confirm the recommended action. I call on Ms. Lamesh for the motion. I move that the probationary teacher identified in closed session be dismissed and his contract not be renewed for the 2022-2023 school year. Is there a second? Ms. Corbett Sanders. All those in favor? That is Ms. Keith, no, Ms. Keith Camara, Ms. Omesh, Ms. Tolan, Ms. Corbett Sanders, Ms. Jarenat Koufax, Ms. McLaughlin, Ms. Cohen, and uh, Ms. Pekarski. All those opposed? All those abstaining? Dr. Anderson, Ms. Marin, that motion passes. Agenda item five, consent agenda. Our adopted rules of parliamentary procedure, Robert's Rules, provide for a consent agenda listing several items for approval of the board by a single motion. Many items listed have gone through board review and documentation has been provided to all board members and the public in advance. Items may be removed from the consent agenda at the request of any board member prior to the meeting. The consent agenda items are on the screen. 
Is there any objection to approving the consent agenda? Hearing and seeing no objection, the consent agenda is approved. Agenda item six, new business. The following are new business agenda items. There will not be a vote on these items this evening, but action is scheduled at a future meeting. The new business items are on the screen. Agenda item seven, board committee reports. I call on Ms. Corbett Sanders for a governance committee update. Yes, thank you, Madam Chair. The governance committee had a very productive meeting yesterday. We reviewed policy changes to the eligibility for enrollment policy 2020, 2022 to align it with state code and removing the requirement for additional FCPS mandated documentation by parents and guardians of students moving into our school system. This has been added to new business for the board. We were briefed by Assistant Superintendent Fanshawe on his suggested approach to revising the Environmental Stewardship uh, Policy 8542, the Building Evaluation, Building Renovation and Infrastructure Maintenance Policy 8258, the Site Planning and Development uh, Policy 8310, and reviewed suggested changes to the Architectural and Engineering Services 8220, which has been added to new business for the board. After review by the committee, Mr. Fanshawe will be looking with his staff, will be working with his staff on the following policies to be brought back to governance. These include vehicle replacement policy 8611, security of buildings and grounds policy 8612, and school bus transportation, walking and bicycling routes policy 8610. We also had a robust discussion about how to address the backlog and policies that are past due for board review. The clerk's tracking system will be modified to include more information on the status of each pending item. Policies have been grouped by department and sent to the superintendent and her team to prior prioritize the review. Finally, the committee had a brief discussion on the resolutions and recognitions policy and will be discussing it in more depth at a future meeting. Thank you. I call on Ms. Cohen for a report on the Audit Committee. Thank you. The Audit Committee met on October 12th and reviewed the OAG report on the IT technology platform implementation and hardware acquisition and management audit. Um, I'm so appreciative of Ms. Co and her team and would like to particularly thank Khaled Abu Diab um, for his work on this. We were very grateful to hear our staff response from the Chief Information Officer Gotham Setsi and his team. The IT team has made or is in the process of making all the recommendations from the audit findings and the entire process has been extremely collaborative. Thank you so much to both the OAG and IT teams. Thank you. I call on Ms. McLaughlin for an update from the Public Engagement Committee. Thank you. Uh, the Public Engagement Committee met and discussed uh, a number of topics. The first one was our standing um, committees reviewing um, any recommended changes that we might want to bring forward to um, the full board. Um, we also wanted to make sure that the board was aware that the prior PEC um, did have um, changes and recommendations for our citizen advisory committee handbooks and that is pending a future work session for all of you to review. Uh, and then we also um, discussed surveying um, school board members and um, getting more clarification about school board member roles, um, serving, as on, serving as the liaisons for non-school board advisory committees, whether some of them are still relevant and meaningful. Uh, we talked about the strategic plan and the importance of having the robust public engagement process and how PEC could work with Dr. Reed and her team on that. Um, we then talked about the, two, the school year uh, 2023 24 uh, calendar public engagement process. And uh, in the past, the PEC committee has worked closely with senior staff at um, reviewing input from the calendar committee, uh, reviewing the surveys that um, are going out to employees and families just to see if there's anything that we as the uh, school board members might want to suggest be added or included. Um, and so that will be ongoing. Uh, we also talked about the ESSER three funds community engagement process. And then uh, we finally talked about our school board newsletters and the email distribution lists because there's some clarity that needs to happen about how are those 
opt in? Are they opt out? You know, what was the understanding in the past? We've got families that come in every month, every year, and how are those, you know, we're making sure that given that we know often families will tell us that they may miss an FCPS news message, but they will see our newsletters, open it up and learn. So um, anyway, those were kind of the highlights of, of what we're covering in, in PEC. Thank you, Ms. McLaughlin. I'll call on Ms. Keats Kamara for a CPDC update. Thank you. The CPDC met on Monday, October 17th. We welcome new board committee members, Ricardi Anderson and Mac Megan McLaughlin. Um, we also had a discussion regarding the roles of CPDC and FPAC, and, uh, and we welcomed um, their liaison, um, Elaine Tolan. We are examining the intersectionality of the Planning Commissioner, Board of Supervisors, and the School Board with respect to development, and we look forward to reporting to the Board shortly. Thank you. Thank you. I call on Ms. Tolan for a budget report. Thank you. Um, we did have a, a board work session on October 11th where we, um, and from that I have compiled comments and am working toward uh, a mid-November resolution for the board with um, my co-chair, Ms. Bukarski, um so that we can give additional direction to Dr. Reed for development of the budget this, this year. Um, just a reminder to the public that um, in November, well, even right now, through October 24th at 10 p.m., we are still seeking online feedback from the community on use of our ESSER 3 funds. And if you go to the um, FCPS um, Elementary and Secondary School Emergency Relief ESSER 3 portion of our website, you can uh, make those comments. That is through Monday. We will have a work session on our ESSER spending on November 1st from 2 to 4 and a public hearing on November 3rd at 6 p.m. If you'd like to register for that hearing, um, the sign-up will open tomorrow, um, 1021 at 6 a.m. on the FCPS School Board webpage. Um, in November, we're setting up a meeting with myself and um, our board chair to meet with the Board of Supervisors Chairman Jeffrey McKay and others on our budget planning. And on November 22nd from 3 to 5, just a reminder to all of my colleagues that we will be having our joint meeting with the Board of Supervisors to begin our joint budget process. Thank you. Thank you. Agenda item 8, board matters. And um, since I always start on that side, I'm going to start on this side this time, just to be fair. So. I will start with Ms. Keys Gamara. Thank you. Uh, this past month has been, I'm sorry, these past two weeks, it looks like a month, um, have been quite busy. I had uh, fun attending the Woodson homecoming with Megan McLaughlin and the Herndon homecoming. Um, I also had an opportunity to poke my head into the audit committee meeting, which I enjoyed very much. And I attended the Excellence Awards and Reception and re Ceremony uh, with Ms. Elaine Tolan and um, Abrar Amesh. So we had an opportunity to celebrate some of our staff members as uh, they, have been, they have been recognized for their excellence in the way that they serve our community. Um, I also had an opportunity to participate in the Military Family Community Conversation uh, virtually with Dr. Reed and um, really appreciated the insights we were able to hear. I was there, um, Ms. Uh, Sizemore Heiser was there uh, along with um, Ms. Corbett Sanders. And um, this past weekend, I was able to attend the Dunloring Improvement Association picnic, which um, probably entitles me to um, a exercise program or something like that. They had great food, uh, but it was wonderful. And coming up on November 9th, Educate Fairfax will have their leaders and learners breakfast. I hope that everyone will join us as we celebrate the special bond between our schools and the larger Fairfax community with a number of our business partners. Um, and if for more information, please visit the Educate Fairfax website to purchase tickets. Thank you, and everyone have a good night. Thank you. Ms. Marin? 
Yes, I'm going to keep it focused on student-related things that I was involved with and working on. I guess everything's student-related, but with students this week, um, or last week over at Oakton High School, we were um, invited, a few of us were able to attend the annual Oakton High School candidate and elected leaders panel, and it's such a really great opportunity. The whole senior class goes, there's two panels, a local panel, and that was with some of us school board members, and then the federal panel, and um, you know, just like our school board representative tonight did, they held our feet to the fire and asked us really pointed questions. And I just hope that students um, continue to learn about their local government and register to vote and vote. Um, and with that, I'll actually just um, go ahead and put a plug in for you know a reminder that there is an election this year because in every year there is an election in Virginia. So um, hey, Dr. Reed, this could be your first election if you've registered to vote in Virginia. That's what you could do with your free evening since you're almost done. Right? You could vote till seven o'clock. Um, early voting, no no reason needed these days. So. Um, so I'll, I'll leave it at that so I can go home and see my own two kiddos who I've been uh, doing a lot lately with their own educational needs and just constantly learning about our school system through the lens of being a parent with my children, whether it's middle school and learning the transition to middle school and how we can better improve things like Schoology and direct instruction for students around using that learning tool to my fourth grader and the different uh, technology he could use to access better you know, literacy learning. So uh, it's, it's a very, the days are very full and I just am um, gonna keep working for our kids. Thanks. Thank you, Ms. Omesh. Thanks. Um, since we cut off dialogue earlier, I, I mean, I hate to do this, but uh, if without objection, I actually would like to um, correct my vote uh, and, and, and oppose the resolution, mostly because, you know, it's difficult when we received it this morning to, to be fully thoughtful of the consequences, but in being a little bit more reflective, I'm actually concerned that it might cause a little bit more harm than we had planned for. Specifically, um, in the end, it kind of just slipped in there uh, where we, we suggest that we support our teachers as they teach FCPS approved curriculum. Uh, and that suggests that teachers shouldn't, you know, enlighten their, their students with additional materials, things that have not been vetted specifically uh, through a process that is limited. Um, and it ends up kind of countering the whole spirit of this resolution to begin with. Uh, so the idea is we want to be expansive in our thinking, um, but unfortunately I think with this we inadvertently ended up lending power to reinforcing the very same oppressive structures that have existed. So I'm a little bit concerned about that. I also am concerned that we mentioned the controversial issues policy without reflecting that we don't necessarily stand by the current version uh, and are looking towards changing that. Specifically, it stand, the, the policy stance on this idea that there's some kind of ability to be an impartial uh, conversator on a variety of controversial issues, which we all know is, is not a real thing. Uh, impartial only seems impartial to those in the majority who agree with the perspective of the majority. So um, I, I think these, these are uh, deeply concerning aspects. I'm hopeful that my colleagues can be reflective maybe next year when we do this again, that we revise these pieces since we didn't really give it the... I don't know, the reflection required, uh, having only seen it this morning. Um, and then, of course, adding the uh, anti-racist piece, which was eliminated uh, and ultimately was, I mean, de facto censorship, I think, in, in the sense that, again, the, the whole purpose of this is to say that we recognize systemic injustice, uh, you know, systemic racism exists, and so we ought to teach beyond that, uh, but inherently by removing that concept, we are engaging in the very thing we're trying to critique by having this resolution altogether. So, um, you know, I, I, I know that's not the intent of my colleagues. I know my colleagues, you know, believe in empowering all our students and removing the blockers to their learning. Um, but I, I'd like to make sure that's reflected in the vote um, and really did have to just tap into my conscience on that one because it's, it's, it's frustrating to have to continuously wrestle and just try to force a way to see how the more collaborative option or allegedly collaborative, you know, we talked about the limitations of that, is the better option when some things are just clear. So um, that's, that's my take for tonight and I wish everyone a reflective uh, and blessed night. Thank you, Ms. Tolan. Yes, thank you. Um, I would like to extend a f 
a huge thank you to the Longfellow Choir um, for coming this evening and singing the national anthem. I think they did an amazing job. Um, I talked a little bit earlier about my uh, ride with the, the bus driver supervisor, so I won't go into that at this point. Um, since the last meeting, um, we have had some serious discussions um, at Kent Gardens Elementary School regarding the overcrowding there. And um, we'll, you know, have filled in a number of my colleagues on the discussions there. We are continuing to uh, compile information and input from the community on a special web page that was set up by our communications department. And um, we'll staff will be meeting next week to go over all of those, uh, all of that input. And I will um, pass information on to all of my colleagues on, on what we're seeing there. Um, I also enjoyed the FCPS Excellence Awards and um, also had the opportunity with Ms. Marin to attend a Cornerstones Community Forum um, last week. I was really proud to see um, two principals from Herndon, Candace Hudson and um, Sarah Aiello attend as well and um, participate in the education forum section of that meeting. We also had some very serious discussions on um, health for our community, affordable housing, and economic development, and um, really looked at some ways that all of the organizations that attended need to collaborate. Um, I was thrilled to attend the Chesterbrook Kickball Challenge. Um, that was a fun uh, community evening. And just last night, thank you to Dr. Reed for attending the um, McLean Citizens Association Student Forum, where um, she got, we all got very interesting questions from students on a wide range of topics, ranging from where are the salad bars um, to when are those uh, solar panels going to be installed at Annandale High School. Happy to say that was on the new business um, tonight. And, um, you know, lo just lots of other questions. We got our email today, summary email with like 10 or 12 different areas where the students asked some great questions. Um, the Langley Pyramid um, Community Conversation with Dr. Reed is October 26th, so coming up next week um, from 6.30 to 7.30. So please join us there. I just want to point out the uh, Longfellow Middle School Quiz Bowl team um, and their sponsor, um, Mr. Huang, um, had an amazing performance and their A team uh, won the national championship and the B team came in uh, number five and they were honored last week by the Board of Supervisors. McLean High School's Highlander News Magazine and their news broadcast team have been selected for the National Scholastic Press Association um, Broadcast um, Peacemaker Finalist Award. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Corbett Sanders. Yes, thank you. And um, before I go to my board matters, I do want to address the issue about the um, curriculum. The language in the board, uh, that the board adopted this evening, talks about FCPS curriculum. And then Dr. Reed talked about the importance of alignment. And that's really what we're talking about, is using resources, text, and uh, other, other um, enhancements to our program of studies that are aligned with the priorities of Fairfax County Public Schools. And that Fairfax County Public Schools has made it very clear that those priorities include our equity policy, our non-discrimination policy, our anti-bias, anti-hate, uh, policies, our, our uh, forum topics, and our curriculum aligned with that. And so it is really important to not look at the term curriculum, F FCPS curriculum, narrowly, but looking at it as how anything that supports and is in alignment with those priorities are accepted and encouraged by all of our teachers to ensure that our students are able to see themselves reflected in the literature that they use, in the uh, history that is taught, that is both the good, the bad, and the ugly, and ensuring that um, we honor what those commitments are. Tonight was about not, uh, it was really about supporting teachers in, in 
reinforcing the importance of teachers and administrators in that area. And with that, if I could go on to say, it's been a busy couple of weeks, uh, lots of homecomings, PTA meetings, community meetings, and more, um, including the ribbon cutting, cutting at the Lorton Community Center, which is a combined um, athletic facility, a uh, place where people can learn with all sorts of courses and a library as well as uh, community services or county services there. I encourage everybody in South County to go see it. Um, I also was able to attend the uh, conflict resolution breakfast yesterday where we focused on restorative justice and uh, alternative accountability models. I wish Ms. McLaughlin had been with us. We have uh, spent a lot of time in that area and was able to uh, go to the STEAM Fest at the new Hybla Center. This coming week, uh, we have the West Potomac Community Conversation on the 27th, as well as the 10-year anniversary of uh, South County Middle School, where there will be a uh, presentation of our resolution in support of it, as well as the Board of Supervisors resolution on that. And um, everybody have a wonderful Halloween. Thank you. Dr. Anderson? Thank you very much. Before I get started on my remarks, I too, like Ms. Omesh, did not have the opportunity to address an issue that took place earlier. And I was really hoping that Ms. Um, McLaughlin would be here to hear it. I, I really wanted to convey that I am so deeply disappointed in some of the comments that she made. Um, she shared that she was trying her best in order to unify but in her comments, I was maligned for my timeline. So I need to make sure that I address that. Because the schedule of the resolution that I brought forward began on September the 5th to the full board. I sent a version on the 5th, I sent a version on September 22nd, and I sent a third version on October the 2nd, and then a fourth version last evening. And the reason why that was last evening instead of earlier, because edits came in on Thursday, Friday, and we were on the phone for multiple hours on last Friday. More edits came in on Monday, Tuesday. And then I did this to myself on Tuesday afternoon. And I had to be at the doctor's on Wednesday morning. So, Yesterday being Wednesday evening, spent two more hours with you on the phone about edits, more time with Ms. Keys Gamara about edits, more time with Ms. McLaughlin about edits, and then it was sent as quickly as humanly possible. I do not want to have my integrity maligned. I do not want to have my work ethic questioned. And this is what happened this evening, and I will not let that be the last word on it. So, thank you, Dr. Reed, for the visits to Glasgow Middle School and Justice High School last week. I had the opportunity to attend the Fall Inspire Conference at Glasgow Middle School last Saturday, which was a wonderful opportunity for our parents to come into the building to learn about resources for their students, to learn about how they can advocate for their students to engage in the very work that their students participate in. So Mr. Powell, thank you so much for organizing that as well as, well, with homes and key middle schools. Last week, I also had the opportunity to attend the bell game. Um, this was the bell game between Falls Church and Justice High School. And just like last year, the guest team took home the trophy. So excited for you, Falls Church. This week, the Justice Homecoming is, well, actually tomorrow, the 21st. And that is my time. Good night, all. Ms. Cohen? Thank you. Um, I really enjoyed getting to go to the bus driver um, and ad attendant advisory committee with Dr. Reed a couple weeks ago. Um, I just thought they were amazing and, and really had um, 
just an unbelievable commitment to our kids, which we certainly mentioned during our bus driver safety, um, and even got to see Dr. Reed sink a pretty significantly far, um, <laughs> maybe two-pointer, three-pointer. You feel like it was a three-pointer? Um, I uh, also had the opportunity to go to Sangster, Hunt Valley, and Union Mill uh, this week, or this weekend, last week, um, Robinson's PTSO meeting last night. Um, like Ms. Mira and I really enjoyed uh, getting to be with Ms. Bakarski and Ms. Sizemore Heiser at Oakton's Candidates Day. It was just awesome. The kids were amazing, and um, I think we all really get inspired and refreshed every time we get to hang out with you guys, Ms. Togby. Um, and then uh, very much enjoyed the Centerville High School community conversation this week. I thought parents asked, amazing, and staff asked outstanding questions. Everyone has been different, which has been shocking to me. There's a couple of themes, but generally um, just a lot of really interesting feedback. So I've enjoyed it. Next Tuesday, I hope folks will join us for the last one in the Springfield District, which is um, at West Springfield High School Tuesday night. And uh, I wish everybody a good night. Ms. Pekarski. Okay, thank you. It has been a very, very busy um, two weeks with all good things. I had a school visit to the Davis Career Center where Principal Clayton was very, um, just, just incredible in the amount of time that he spent with me and talking through his, his ideas and just the ways he, ha he has really improved the offerings to our um, students who are working on those transitions and being prepared to go out in the workforce and, um, and what, whatever path they take next. I, it was just very inspiring. And he saw that I, he looked me up and saw I had lots of kids and sent me home with a huge <laughs> um, tray of cookies that the students have made. So my kids were quite happy that night. Um, I had a great time at the Dig Pink Volleyball Tournament in Oakton, uh, benefiting the metastatic breast cancer. So thank you for all the volunteers, for all the work um, that you do uh, for that event. Um, it was a lot of fun. Um, I very much enjoyed the candidate stay at Oakton High School. It was just very inspiring to talk to students and hear their ideas and um, really push us to think about why we do the things we do and really talk about how, you know, our work um, and, and our value, and the things we value um, are seen uh, through our policies and our um, investments in our budget. Um, I want to say happy Diwali to all who are celebrating, of course. I've got some upcoming visits with Dr. Reed in uh, Westfield High School, Bull Run Elementary, and Virginia Run Elementary that I'm looking forward to. We had wonderful community conversations at Oakton and High Centerville High School, so thank you for all who came. And I had a very, very fun event with my colleague, Ms. Uh, Sizemore. Heiser, when we had the opportunity to participate in the Westfield Homecoming Parade. Um, so that was, that was a lot of fun. Thank you. Good night, everyone. Thank you. Thank you. Ms. Darnack Koufax? Thank you. Just briefly uh, to my colleagues, if you need a shot of positivity, I know you all do this, but visit our schools. Um, honestly, uh, I want to thank the principal, staff, and students of the schools that I've recently visited, West Springfield High School, West Springfield Elementary, Mount Vernon High School, and Edison High School, where I met with students and staff um, from the School Advisory Council. It's all, always eye-opening, and it's truly a pleasure to be in our schools to witness the great learning that is going on, that will continue to going, go on, and we will continue to get better each and every day and each and every year. So uh, thank you to uh, all of those staff members and students who I were, were able to meet with. You continue, continue to amaze me and inspire me, so thank you. Thank you, and I will um, take my turn. First, I want to say happy Diwali to everybody who's out there. Um, just as a point, as the first Indian American on this board, I'm really excited that we celebrate Diwali, and I will say one of the 
small but important things that I saw was there's actually, um, I think it was at Walmart, a bin full of fireworks being sold now. And that is a big thing on Diwali. It's a, it's a festival of lights, and so you set off fireworks. But growing up, we always had to remember to buy our fireworks in June or July and save them for October because it was really difficult. This is pre-Amazon. It was really difficult to find fireworks in October. And it's a small, small thing, but the, the excitement to see fireworks at Walmart in October f and with a big sign saying for Diwali was just a really cool way for someone who grew up um, with a teacher who refused to say my name and with a real lack of understanding about the Indian culture um, to see that was, was a real sense of belonging. So happy Diwali to everybody. Um, Having said that, I really enjoyed um, the Westfield homecoming. I, I was so lame, I forgot to bring candy. So thank you for uh, the Region 5 team and Ms. Bukarski for sharing your candy with me so I could um, toss them to the students in our parade. It was so much fun and, and the excitement of the students. I enjoyed my meeting with VOICE, our Virginians organized for interfaith community engagement. Um, many of their leaders are current or former principals, counselors, and educators. And we really enjoyed discussing the behavioral health needs of our students and how to partner together so we can all um, be a space for you know to, to become a trusted adult for our students to partner together with our schools um, to, to help the behavioral health needs of our students um, I really enjoyed the military families community conversation that dr. Reed held um, and, and really listening to the concerns for our military families and the, the I would say one of the things that really heartened me from hearing from our families was how many of them said we want to partner with you we want to bring our unique perspectives and our expertise to help you better serve us. And that was that's what I, I hope everybody takes away is that we really want to partner with people to bring your unique perspectives and experiences and thoughts to help us better serve you. Um, you know, I enjoy the Oakton High School Candidates Day, as many of my um, colleagues have mentioned. And I, it's, it's my favorite thing to do is when I get a chance for students to ask me questions and ask us questions and really hear their thoughtful thoughts on what it is that we do, how we can serve them better, and it was just, it, it made me happy to, to hear our students ask us questions. And um, I know I'm standing between you and your bed, so I will stop here. But I just wanted to say, I know tonight was a, a difficult night. And um, I, I really support our teachers developing our FCPS curriculum. And I, I'm really glad that we have a resolution that supports our teachers in developing our curriculum to be more inclusive. Um, but at the end of the day, I'm excited to get into budget season and looking at our strategic plan because that's really where we show our values. Where do we spend our money and, how, and what our vision is for our school. So thank you, and with that, this meeting is adjourned. <laughs>